those too. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two. So we're about two minutes out from starting. If you uh, could finish your registration, grab your uh, coffee and juice, and kind of start making your ways to the tables, we'll get started here in a few minutes. Morning. How are you? How was your evening? Good. I uh, ordered a Hampton Express takeout. <laughs> isn't that isn't that crazy? But you know it was good. It's nothing like my, to study and to study. My son and I go there after like soccer game or something. It's like just he needs to eat. I bet. And yeah. uh, it's like it's like he gets like a lot of what he likes, and uh, I'll eat a little bit of that. And yeah. It's like awesome. It's comfort food. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. He just played 90 minutes of soccer. He's really? out of gas. How old's your son? 16. Yeah, he won't play football. He doesn't want to get a head injury. He's a smart kid. But he's no, he's careful about that. He's been professionally trained. So yeah, he's, he plays competitive ball. And uh, so so indoor, we play indoor, and it's a uh, usually five v five, six v six on the basketball courts. So it's really good for foot skills. Um, and uh, and then the kids, you send them to tournaments down in the lower forty eight. No. no, they have to use their foot skills. Bryce just came in. Okay. Okay, so we have all of our, so we have, let me get this kicked off here. Okay. Okay. 
All right, everybody, good morning to day two of the Clear the Air conference. We're going to kick this thing off here. Thank you for, uh, uh, for coming today. I know the weather is not real cooperative, but we'll, we'll make the best of it. We're from Fairbanks. So we got a pretty uh, packed agenda today, and I'm going to do my best to keep us on track. And uh, so if you see me kind of herding people along, that's what we're trying to do. A um, couple things going on today that you might be interested in. The uh, burn demo, we're going to try to make another run at that burn demo with the two stoves. Um, outside on the trailer. If you didn't see it yesterday, it was pretty cool. Um, the uh, air quality staff uh, set up a couple stoves, identical stoves, identical setups, put uh, wet wood in one and dry wood in the other and, they, uh, and measured some uh, results. It was pretty darn neat. So if you have a chance to check that out, uh, go for it. Glenn, what time do you think we'll start that? Right now. They're starting, they're firing it up right now. So. About 10.30, so at the 10.30 break, uh, maybe make your way out there and take a look at what they're up to. Um, we're gonna do some Insta polling today and we have a couple pre uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, stuff that's come out of the uh, uh, stakeholders group. We'll look at, we'll share that information with the gang here, the group, and um, we'll have some breakout sessions later in the afternoon. So some housekeeping before we get rolling. Um, if you got a cell phone, I know a lot of folks have cell phones, uh, for respect, just pull it out and put it on silent. I you know we use our cell phones all the time, but uh, for respect for the presenters and other folks in the room, just, just keep those things quiet. Um, exits, if we got to get out of this building, we're going to form up across the parking lot. Uh, there's a big, a medium-sized birch tree across the parking lot and across the driveway. To get to that, you can go out this way, obviously. Um, if you've got to go out these two doors, you can go out that door. There's a set of gazebo type doors or French doors. You can go out there and head back around this way. Or you can go all the way through that exit and down the hall and wind your way out to the outside and come around the building. So staff will kind of take accountability of folks and we'll let the, whoever needs to do what they need to do take care of it. We're going to go out that way. Um, so if you haven't filled out this little blue form to enter the drawing, there's another woodshed that we're gonna, that we're gonna draw for today at the end of the day. We have one woodshed left. It is a woodshed, it's not a chicken coop, it's not an outhouse, it's a woodshed. So we're gonna give that away later today. Um, if you are interested in the presentations or, t or the um, reviewing the uh, video footage, we did webcast this and we recorded those webcasts. If you want to see those documents or see that video footage, it's going to be on the uh, air quality uh, website, www.aqfairbanks.com. Uh, and you can get to that from the borough website or just go to www.aqfairbanks.com. All those documents, all those presentations will be there. If they're not there now, they'll be there very, very quickly. So that's all I have for housekeeping. First up today, we have the three mayors with us. So over here, I'll just introduce them real quick. From the Fairbanks North Star Borough, a person I see probably every day, three, four, five, six times a day. I know him pretty well. Yeah, too frequently. Uh, Mayor Carl Castle, he'll be first up on deck. And then uh, from the city of North Pole, Mayor Bryce Ward. It looks like he's getting ready to go out and do a construction job here pretty soon. So he's a working mayor. And then uh, from the city of Fairbanks, uh, just reminding Mayor Matherly that the statute of limitations still apply. Please be careful. Um, he'll be up here to talk to you after Mayor Ward. So I'm going to cut that off and uh, give it over to Mayor Castle. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Uh, well, thank you for being here. Hopefully we'll get some more folks rolling in Saturday morning here. You know, it's kind of drizzly outside, so it's much better being in here. Um, do appreciate your, you being here. Text a friend, tell them to come down, fill out your form for the woodshed. It's currently a woodshed, as Jim said, but you could convert it into like a two-hole or outhouse or whatever. It has options. If you win it, you, you know, it's yours to do with as you choose. We just hope you keep your wood dry. Uh, that demonstration is really nice to take a look at. Uh, it was incredibly dramatic yesterday with wood that the two sources were only 14% different and I didn't expect to see much difference in emissions with that close of moisture content, but uh, there was a noticeable difference, particularly in heat output. So check out the graphs for heat output. I'm kind of economically minded, and when you can get twice the amount of heat out of the same wood, if it's just dry, before you put it in the stove. Um, that pencils out pretty nice on the economic side of things. So a lot to think about there. I want to give a huge kudo while he's got his mouth full in the back. Hi, Matt, chewing away from AUP. Um, yeah, Matt, thanks. <clears throat> 
So AUP is uh, once again working with us, and they're the folks that are getting this out on YouTube, uh, live streaming it, as well as then getting the YouTubes posted later. So if you missed presentations from yesterday that you want to see, um, go to uh, the YouTube. You can get there through our site or I think AUP's site also. Uh, either way, and check out those presentations from yesterday. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> We're trying to add to the diversity a little bit and who's engaged in the discussion. I think we've done a good job this year in getting a broader scope of individuals to attend and participate. And that's a good thing because the whole community needs to be part of the solution. That's a big part of this. Um, we all have to be engaged. And like most things, if we all do a little bit, we get there. Uh, and we can't put the burden just on a few or expect the borough to solve this uh, all on its own or the state or the feds. We just need to work together on it. And we're getting better at that. Uh, we can continue to get better on that with your comments. We picked up a few things from Wendy Mannon's presentation yesterday, even though she's been engaged with this. Um, she included some things there that we hadn't given enough consideration to, and we're already starting to take a look at that going forward. So we welcome comments and suggestions. We'll be doing lots of interactive, fun things today, and thank you very much for being here. Are you introducing Mayor Ward? Oh, Mayor Ward. Ward. Introduced oh, right. so. Come on up, man. <clears throat> well, thanks for being here today. And, and although it was mentioned that this is my work attire, I thought this is this is my business attire. <laughs> uh, I, I did have a little thing I had to do beforehand, so if I'm a little dirty, I apologize. But um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. You know, I, I really think uh, if we look at, especially this week or this the last two days, this is really unprecedented. Um, we've had DEC engagement, we've had Region 10 engagement uh, from the EPA, but yesterday we had the administrator, uh, one of the administrators from the EPA here, um, working with the community, working with the mayors, talking about the issues that we have and how we're dealing with those things and recognizing that we're, we're not, we, we are unique, but we're not that unique, but we are unique. And I think that that's really important because there are certain things that we face in this community, such as extreme sub-zero temperatures that complicate the issue, that make it more difficult for us to be able to come into attainment. But it doesn't mean that we're not gonna be making progress and we're continuing to do that. And I, I do have to speak a, a, a little bit of praise here for Mayor Castle. You know, I, I've been in the North Pole capacity as mayor for six years now, and so I've had the opportunity to work with two administrations um, on the air quality issue. And everyone has a different approach uh, to things, but I want to say that Mayor Castle's approach has been one um, that I think has been very, uh, a very good step for our community. <clears throat> it understands that there are issues at hand that are more than just political phrases. And so when we look at heating our homes, when we look at our air quality, it, it's, it's sometimes easy to say that these are um, kind of exclu exclusive issues and that there's sides to this issue. We all live here, and I think Mayor Castle's done a very good job of bringing people together. We still have a lot of progress that we need to make, but I think we've at least started down a road where we can, we can come up with some sustainable solutions. So thank you for being here today. Um, as we look to the future for our community and we look to the things that we can do, um, you know, really the future is in our hands um, and we are the ones that are going to be able to set our destiny. And I appreciate everyone for being here today um, and understanding that there are things that we can do locally uh, that can make a difference. And so it starts off with meetings like this where we can sit down and talk about the issues, where we can talk about how we can still heat our homes um, with methods and, and uh, fuels that we would like, but that we can do them the most efficient way possible, and that we can create an environment where our friends and families can, can all live here throughout the year. So thank you, uh, and appreciate you all for being here. And next I get to introduce the esteemed Fairbanks City Mayor, Mayor Matherly. <laughs> Esteemed. <laughs> Thank you, soon to be Borough Mayor Bryce Ward. <laughs> he paid me to say that. I want to thank Brian Rogers for being the only man in the room that got the tie memo. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. I appreciate that. I always wear a tie to everything, and I should learn to dress down the way Carl and, and Bryce do. But I tell you what, um, what I got when I was honored enough to be elected, um, 
this really wasn't on my radar all that much. Heat in general, air, it just wasn't. In, in this, I had other city issues. I had no idea uh, the level of importance uh, about this. I mean, you could think about other issues that face our city, and I do every day. You know, there's opioids, there's all sorts of things, but air, I mean, just air. We can't live without air. I've learned more from Mayor Castle and Mayor Ward in the past two years um, about the importance of air quality. And I think it's the biggest thing that we face in the interior. We've got to keep this stuff local that we can work on it. We don't want people telling us what to do. We can handle it. We really can. But we can't show it unless we get together like this and shout it. Because I don't think the feds want to be on our backs. They, they have enough to, to work with. They want us to do it. And we can do it. And we've had to lick these problems ever since statehood in different ways, no matter what we're facing. In fact, I think air quality should be a required a required class in K through 12 almost, because when you turn people loose out of school, they gotta learn about heating things. And I took heat for granted growing up. I mean, they just, fuel showed up, turned up the heat, and I went on my merry way. Well, a lot of people don't use fuel. A lot of people use wood, a lot of people use both. I'm learning so much, as much as I could ever imagine, and I've learned that it is vastly important for people with respiratory issues. It's a health issue is what this is. It's just more than breathing. It's a health issue that faces a lot of people. And like uh, Bryce said, hats off to Carl and his administration and Glenn and everybody associated with air quality for just bringing this to where it belongs at the very top of the stuff. And I've mentioned it to the governor. I've mentioned it to everybody I know, air quality. And that's why the three mayors, and I'm really honored that the fact we get along so well. I don't think administrations sometimes don't get along very well over the years, but uh, the three of us, you know, make commercials. We talk about plugging in at a certain, you know, temperature. We talk about things. We get together because we're all in the same community. I mean, North Pole, but it doesn't matter. We're all in this. We're all living in the same spot. Everybody here is. Um, so I'm committed to helping, and I'm honored to be here. I'll be in and out today a, a little bit. I know you've got a lot on your plate, but do interact, which I know you do, because why else would you be here on a Saturday morning um, in the fall? Uh, uh, but again, welcome to the Wedgwood. I want to thank Sherry Minikaeus and her staff. They always do a wonderful job here at the Wedgwood, and I really hope that you have a really productive day. Go air. Thanks. <laughs> Now here's the esteemed Chief of Staff for Mayor Car Carl Castle, a man that needs no introduction, but he'll get one anyway. Please give it up and a big round of applause for the lovely, the funny, Mr. Jim Williams. So if, uh, so that, so this, this interaction probably gives you some insight to how these three gentlemen work together. And uh, on a serious note, um, even though I am smiling, um, on behalf of the staff of the Fairbanks North Star Borough, I do appreciate how these three gentlemen get along and how they work together. And sometimes they fight. It's pretty interesting to watch, but um, they always come out of the room on the same page. And it makes me, as, a, as the leader um, directing staff, it makes it a lot easier to get things done because I have backup. So I appreciate that. Thank you. So Jan is walking around. We're going to transition real quick here. And you may see these funny looking keypad things on your table. Does anybody not have one of these right now? Okay, everybody's got one of these uh, keypads. So these are Insta polling devices. And what we're going to do, I think, Brittany, are you going to are you going to do the discussion on this, or do you want me to lead it? Is Jana going to do it? Tom's going to do it. Okay, so I'm going to just give you a quick intro of what we're going to do, and then they're going to take it from here. So we're going to ask you some questions, and these questions kind of came out of the stakeholders group and uh, give you some insight on some of the decision making and some of the discussion uh, that happened with that gang of folks who have been working very hard to kind of come up with a solution to our air quality problems. Um, what you'll do is you'll vote on um, the uh, questions and Brittany, do you want to explain how they work? Do you um, want to do it or you want me to do it? Yeah, I can explain how okay. they work. So we'll have questions that correspond to numbers. You'll press the number um, that of your choice. If you decide to change your answer, press the new number to correspond with the answer you would like to change to. And it'll only record your response once and it'll do the most recent number that you have selected. 
Please make sure to return these. Um, we don't want to get charged for any that may walk away. Um, and we also will be using these this afternoon. So, um, Jana, did I miss anything on, on how to use the clickers? Yeah, you don't, oh. that was the only thing. You don't need to use the clear button or the send button. As Brittany explained, if you change your mind or you realize you voted for the wrong thing, just press the new number and we'll tell you when um, polling is gonna close. So good morning. Okay. Thanks for your patience with me, folks. My name is Tom Carlson. I work for a consulting firm, Sierra Research. I'm an atmospheric scientist by trade. That means I study the air, the weather. I, I'm a meteorologist. And meteorologists, as you probably know by watching the evening news, do a, as good a job of forecasting the weather as they can, but they're not always perfect. And to the end of, of science, what we always try and do is get more information. Maybe uh, Brittany or Jim explained the poll that we're about to take is completely anonymous, and it comes out of the work that was done birthed through the stakeholder task force to try and really enhance understanding of uh, people's practices here as it relates to uh, how they heat their homes and uh, other things that they do related to their general knowledge of air quality in the area. So we're gonna conduct a, uh, an electronic poll, as I said, it's completely anonymous to try and enhance information that we have that helps us to better understand what issues people face with the decisions uh, that they need to make regarding home heating and practices related to uh, policies that the agencies are considering adopting uh, to control air pollution. And so with that, I'm gonna read through uh, questions and as Brittany and Jana explained, uh, we'll just uh, answer, you know, with the digits that correspond to the question responses up here. And we're going to try and get through, as I said, about 30 or 40 of them in about half an hour. So the question up there first is an easy one. Where do you live? Fairbanks, North Pole, elsewhere in the borough uh, or outside the borough? Right, so one is Fairbanks, two is North Pole three is elsewhere in the borough, four is outside the Fairbanks North Star Borough. You mean inside the city boundaries of Fairbanks? Uh, inside the city boundaries of Fairbanks and North Pole as listed, yes. Good, clarifi good clarification question. And so we'll see here as uh, you look at the bottom of the screen, correct me if I'm wrong, Jana, but these are responses. So when the, the numbers at the bottom settle down, I'll move on to the next question. If people, as I start to go on to the next question, want more time, why don't you raise your hand and I'll slow down. I think we got the first one. Let's move on to number two. So where do you live is being shown here. This is just a quick, so you can all see how you all responded corporately without any individual information. The next one is, do you live in the Fairbanks slash North Pole PM 2.5 non-attainment area? Uh, yes is one, two is no, three is I don't know. That's a good point, but part of the insight for this question was to see if people knew without a map. Thank you, though. Okay, can we show that result, Jana? Thanks. All right, question number three. What is your primary source of home heat? Number one is fuel oil. Number two is natural gas or propane. Three, electric heat. Four, wood stove. Five, pellet stove, six, coal stove, seven is district heat from Aurora Energy, and eight is anything else that's not explicitly listed there. And again, this is your primary source of heat that this question's focused on.
and as you're thinking about this or waiting for the answers to settle, there'll be some additional questions that will focus on solid fuel specifically. If you're not a solid fuel burner, if it's an explicit question related to sol solid fuel burning practices, feel free to just not answer that question. But there will be questions later that deal with uh, uh, practices that tie to uh, proposed controls that you'll probably want to have a chance to come back and weigh in on. So here's the responses, how that was answered. And interestingly, I'll just make a comment, that looks very much like data that uh, the state has collected through many years of surveys uh, in what we call these home heating surveys. So let's move on to the next one. So this is similar categorical responses, but the question is what is your secondary source of home heat, if any? And, and to just clarify here before I read the responses, if you only have a single source of heat, you would not answer this question. Number nine, thank you very much. I didn't <laughs> finish reading it. So let me read through the, the answers now. One is fuel oil, two is natural gas or propane, three is electric heat, four is wood stove, five is pellet stove, six is coal stove, seven is district heat from Aurora Energy again, eight is other, and nine that I didn't read yet. I don't have a secondary heat source. Okay. All right, that's insightful. Thank you, let's move on. So for you who have a wood stove or another solid fuel burning appliance, this question is how old is your wood, coal, or pellet stove? And as is qualified there, if you have more than one SFBA, just tell us about your primary solid fuel burning appliance. So answer number one is zero to 10 years old, two is 11 to 20 years old, three is 21 to 30 years old, four is over 30 years, and five is I don't know. An example of an I don't know is you moved into a house that had an existing solid fuel burning appliance and you don't know how long it had been there. <clears throat> Yep. Anybody need more time with this one? Well, that's encouraging to see, <clears throat> mostly newer ones. Okay, the next question is, is your solid fuel burning appliance EPA certified? One is yes, two is no, three is I don't know. And as I had alluded to with the question about air quality control zones, answer as best you can with the way the question is phrased. So if you don't know what EPA certified means, try and make your best answer as it relates to what you know about the certification status of your stove. Thank you, everyone. Next question. Again, this is for solid fuel burning appliance users. Does your solid fuel burning appliance have a catalyst? One is yes, two is no, three again is I don't know. Okay, on to the next one. This is a little bit more information that we're asking about your solid fuel burning appliance. Have you participated in the borough's wood stove change out program? And I'll read through the responses carefully. Number one is yes. There's there gonna be three yeses and two noes. The first yes is I did a wood stove to wood stove change out. Number two is yes, I exchanged my solid fuel burning appliance for an oil, natural gas, or propane appliance. 
Number three is, yes, I removed a solid fuel burning appliance, but didn't replace it with anything. Number four is, no, I don't have a solid fuel burning appliance, or I have a solid fuel burning appliance, but I haven't done a change out. And five, the other no is, I don't qualify for the change out program. Fireplaces would be a, in the wood stove category. For the purpose of this question, they'd be treated as a wood stove. Thanks, Rick. Pellets included? Pellets would be a wood stove too, yeah, cordwood or pellet stove. Thank you, everyone. Okay, this question is tied to um, how you use your solid fuel burning appliance. And it reads, once you add fuel to your stove, how long does it take to burn down to ash with few, co few coals? And, and there may be times when you have burn downs that are different but just kind of give an answer to this question based on your average or typical pattern, if you would. And the uh, answers that you can choose from are number one is three to four hours, number two is five to six hours, number three is seven to eight hours, and four is over eight hours. Did anybody need any more time with that one? Okay, <laughs> so there are the responses. Okay, on to the next one. Okay, we're gonna have a few questions that tie to the uh, curtailment program and the alerts as they're announced. Stage one alerts are called during winter inversions when PM 2.5 concentrations exceed 25 micrograms per cubic meter. And the purpose behind stage one alerts is to lower our emissions as quickly as we can so we don't get to the standard, which is 35 micrograms per cubic meter, and rack up a Clean Air Act violation. During a stage one alert, only homes with no other adequate source of heat, the NOAASH acronym you've probably heard, and stage one waivers in the non-attainment area may burn solid fuels. Stage one waivers are available to people who have a borough listed device. And as I said, no ash are homes with no adequate source of heat. So this is just a slide that I read to you to remind you of this element of alerts. And so this next question is, how do you typically learn an air quality alert has been issued? Number one is a text message. Number two is email. Number three is the borough's smartphone app. Number four is the borough's website, aqfairbanks.com. Five is the borough's information line. Six is radio. Seven is TV news. Eight is social media. Nine, road signs. And 10, what's an alert? And 10 is the zero button. Okay, thank you. 10 is the zero button if you didn't hear Jana there. And again, this is typical. You may hear it several different ways, but we wanna know the most common. Interesting mix of answers. Okay, so the first question that you just answered was how do you learn about them? This one is a related question. How would you prefer to learn an air quality alert has been issued? And similar responses, one, text message, two, email, three, borough smartphone app, four, borough website, five borough information phone line, six radio, seven TV news, eight social media, nine road signs, and 10, I don't live in the non-attainment area. How am I doing on time, Jim? Since you're the timer. Okay.
Now, there seemed to be some consistency between the that one and the preceding one, so thank you, everyone. Okay, the next one is related to us. There's a couple questions related to us understanding uh, how we might broadcast the alerts and get them better in place in time for people to modify their practices when the alerts are called. So this one asks, if an air quality alert is issued at 4 p.m., how soon do you typically become aware of it? And the answers are, number one, within the hour, by 5 p.m., number two, by 6 p.m., three is by 7 p.m., four is after 7 p.m., and five is I don't typically hear when alerts are issued. We have time. Let's give a couple more minutes for this one. Okay. Thank you. If an alert is needed for a multi day period, which means it's in place for more than 24 hours, which policy would you prefer? Answer number one is. Issue a multi-day alert at the start and then cancel it when it's no longer needed. Number two is issue a sequence of one-day alerts for as long as needed. Number three is it doesn't matter as long as I know when alerts are issued. And number four is, again, related to the fact that some people may not live in the non-attainment area and be subject to alert notifications. Okay, we were talking about stage one alerts and just alert questions related to timing in general. These next few questions, I think, deal with the, the second stage. Stage two alerts are issued when PM 2.5 concentrations exceed the standard 35 micrograms per cubic meter. At that point, air is considered very unhealthy and we are in violation of the Clean Air Act. During a stage two alert, all homes in the area are prohibited from burning solid fuels unless they have a no ash waiver. So at this point, if you, even if you have a borough listed device, unless you're no ash, you're prohibited from burning. So stage two question is when a stage two alert is issued, how often do you burn solid fuel, wood pellets or coal? And again here, we're asking the questions with anonymity. We're not trying to pin anybody down. We're just trying to understand and, and as I said a minute ago, some of these questions relate to improving the schedule and the mechanisms for calling alerts to be more helpful. So number one is never. I never burn fuel once a stage two alert is called. Two is occasionally, three is usually, four is always, five, I have a no ash waiver, six, I live outside the non-attainment area. In the first 24 hours after a stage two alert has been issued, approximately 4 p.m. in the afternoon, when will you typically add fuel to your solid fuel burning appliance? Again, this isn't an underhanded question to get you to admit you've violated the alert. It's just trying to understand if the alert being called as it is at four o'clock is getting in people's uh, heads quickly enough an example is I come home, I throw a load of fuel on the fire, but then I go and read social media or something to find things out. So we're not trying to track down non-compliance with this question. So the answers are when I first arrive home is when I typically add fuel. Two is sometime in the evening. Three, when I go to bed. Four, the following morning or afternoon. Five, no fuel is ever added until alert is canceled. Six, I have a no ash waiver. And seven, again, I don't live in the non-attainment area.
Any questions about this question? Okay. If an alert has been in effect for a multi-day period, are fires ever restarted or refueled after the first 24 hours? One is yes, two no, three I don't know, four is I don't live in the non-attainment area. Thank you. We're going to ask some questions about wood collection and purchase here, so we're out of the uh, uh, alert questions. In a typical year, how many cords of wood do you use? One is less than a cord, two is anywhere from one to four cords, three is five to nine cords, four is ten or more cords, five is my household doesn't use firewood. So everybody can answer this question, even if you're not a firewood user, you'd answer five. Thank you. So this is a purchase question, wood purchasing, not cutting your own wood. In a typical year, how much of your firewood do you buy? One is none, two is about 10%, three is about 25%, four is 50%, five is 75%, six is 90%, seven, I buy all my wood. Eight, my household doesn't use firewood. Another question related to purchasing firewood. If you do purchase it, how do you typically get firewood that you purchase? Number one is split firewood. Two, bucked but not split. Three, cordwood. Four, my household doesn't purchase firewood. In an average year, so this is a question that's going to be related to collecting your own wood, not purchasing it. In an average year, how many hours do you and members of your household spend cutting, splitting, and stacking firewood that you use to heat your own home? So this is wood for your, your household. One is less than an hour, two is one to five hours, three, six to ten hours, Four is 11 to 20 hours, five is 21 to 40 hours, six is over 40 hours, seven, my household doesn't heat with wood. As we're going through this, you guys are all getting good practice for the election in early October. Okay, thank you. Again, a question about collecting firewood. If you harvest firewood for your own use, how much does your household typically spend in a year for, gas, for gasoline, supplies, equipment, 
maintenance, or other costs that are associated with your cutting or collecting firewood. Don't, don't include money that you spend purchasing firewood or cutting firewood to sell on to someone else. So this is just, again, the, the costs associated with collecting or cutting your own wood for your own use. One is none, two is one to $100, three is 101 to $500, four is 501 to 1,000, five is more than 1,000. Again, this, these are costs per year. And we don't give people an out on this one, so that's probably. OK, that's right. All right, another harvesting question. If you harvest firewood for your own use, oh, this was the response. Thank you. And this was the last question. It was, oh. Well, then I'm just going to say, give yourselves a hand. And I appreciate <laughs> dealing with a pop quiz early on a Saturday morning. And does anybody have any questions or comments based on the quiz and um, or how the alerts are called? Um, well, on several questions, it said, I live in the non-attainment area, as, and it seemed like uh, people who lived in the non-attainment area wouldn't be impacted but I watch the air quality alerts because it determines, and so do a lot of other people, am I gonna go into town or not? Am I gonna go into town to exercise or not? Should my kids be exercising at this time? You know, when's the best time to go into town? You know, I'm gonna put it off for a couple of days. So it does affect everybody in the borough because we all go into town and uh, the vast majority of our kids and the vast majority of workers are at jobs or at schools in the non-attainment area. Thank you. So um, I guess my question is, uh, on the one part it said radio. Um, I know no weather radio puts it out. They also go out on all like the weather alert sites, the messages do. So, you know, are people getting that message? Um, are they getting their information through those messages? Because that would be another avenue. And I, I think a lot of people nowadays have, you know, weather alert apps on their phones, and so they should be getting those messages um, from NOAA. So that, that was just kind of a point I wanted to make. Yeah, and I noticed that um, we asked how many people get their messages in a certain way, and then how would they prefer it. And a lot of people are getting them by text, but almost everybody uh, said that they preferred to get them by text, so. Other questions or comments? Some of the questions could address pellet use. They all, you know, you touched on them a couple times, but there were several times where answers could have been given for pellet use versus wood. Good point. Um, I think one of the advantages of at least continuing uh, with the radio notifications is that it's a community problem. There are a lot of people who don't realize it is a community problem. I've met two people in the past 10 days who moved to Fairbanks <laughs> within the last year and they didn't know that there was an air quality issue here. And if so, that if you're not signed up for texts or looking at weather apps or looking at the North Starboro website, you wouldn't know that if it weren't on the radio. I've brought it up before, but the children in our community are an important source of educating their parents and grandparents. So I think when there is an air quality alert, it's something that schools should make an announcement of also. Because I've noticed my grandkids are very good 
at reinforcing messages that they hear. Thank you. Other comments or questions about how alerts are called or when you get the, the timeliness of when you get the information and how you burn or what would make the information more useful to you? Well, then again, I'll just say thank you for the responses, both to the polling and the feedback as it relates to the questions and other insights that are important. On the question of single day or multi day, I, the reason I pick the multi day is because I, I prefer to have more information about how long it's likely to be so I can plan. So it's yeah. having a little bit more information up front like that I think is useful. Thanks, John. I saw a lot of other heads nodding to that comment as well. Well, along with his comment, it's good to have that daily input as well, those daily updates. Put it out for multi day but have it reinforced on a daily basis so that um, you know, people keep it fresh in their head that it's still going on. Yeah, I agree with that. And, then, and to your point earlier about the, the weather app, the weather app act effectively does that too because we, you know, I'm in the pathetic habit of checking my weather app about three times a day or something like that. Um, and so every time I check it, I see that, I see that alert there so it, when, it, when there is one. So. Thank you. So I guess back to you, Jim. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for participating. Um, just real quick, another housekeeping note. So if uh, after our presentations or during our presentations when we have questions, let's make sure we uh, ask the question in the microphone because we have uh, a dozen or so or more folks uh, on our webcast that are watching this and they'd like to hear those questions also. Uh, we are waiting for our next presenter, and I think he is in route right now. He's about five minutes out. We have a question. So what are we doing with the clickers until our afternoon instant polling? I think we're going to collect them up, and then we'll pass them back out again. Does that sound good, Jan? Yeah, I think that's a great plan, okay. and we will have some more questions in the afternoon, and they're going to be... Uh, not related uh, directly to, to wood burning, so uh, it's a totally different set of questions. Um, part of them will be a knowledge quiz, and the same quiz that our stakeholders took at the beginning, and we've altered it slightly for this audience to make it easier. Okay. So our next presenter is walking up. I'm going to give him a chance to collect himself real quick. Hi, Jesse, how are you? <laughs> are you ready to go? Yeah. Let me do an intro real quick. And I'll tee up your slides. Okay, so we're about 10 minutes ahead of schedule here. So let me introduce Jesse Shadley. Uh, Jesse has lived in the interior since 2006 and moved to North Pole five years ago. After finishing his service with the U.S. Army in 2010, he worked for four years as a heat technician, then transitioned to work as a security guard on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. He now works as a bench jeweler in Fairbanks. Jesse lives in North Pole and represents the Fairbanks North Star Borough wood burning community on the Borough Air Quality Stakeholder Group. Please join me in a warm welcome to my neighbor, Jesse Shadley. Morning. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit late and delays with kids. Uh, I'm sure most of us understand how that goes. Um, so my presentation today, uh, forgive me, I'm not a PowerPoint guy, so I just kind of fumbled my way through most of it. Uh, but it's about the economics of home heating. Uh, it, when you live half the year in the winter, it's kind of a big factor in how you live your daily life up here. So. Um, <clears throat> Definition of BTU, uh, it's the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. Uh, that's kind of the universal you know, term used for all of this. <coughs> um, <coughs> wood, uh, it's 
it's kind of the bad guy in the room, but it's economical, it's renewable, and if you do it right, it can actually be pretty clean. Um, it's the most economical of the heat sources we have available, um, and it can even be free with the exception of your gas, time, and a whole lot of effort. Um, <clears throat> but it's got to be split, got to be stored, stacked, and seasoned in order to burn it as cleanly and efficiently as you can. Green wood is up to 50% moisture, but it needs to be 20% or less to burn clean. Um, otherwise, you're going to get smoke and you're going to waste a bunch of your BTUs just trying to burn off that excess moisture. Uh, when you're burning it, if you see steam or moisture or hear hissing, your, your wood's too wet. So get a moisture meter. Uh, it's my understanding that you can pick them up AIH and if nothing else, I think air quality has some that you can probably go ask about. Um, <clears throat> wood's measured by, by cords. Uh, that's four foot by four foot by eight foot. Birch, you're looking at 23.6 million BTUs per cord. Uh, it's considered a hardwood, so it burns hot and long. This is my personal favorite. You get some, some white stuff off of the bark, but you know, other than that, it's pretty clean, pretty easy to work. It's heavy, uh, but it, you can load up a good quality wood stove in the morning, and it's still got a good bed of coals when you get home in the evening. So you can load it twice a day and, and no, no real swings in temperature. Um, you're looking at about 350 per cord, split and delivered, or like I say, if you go out and get your own, it's a whole lot cheaper. Uh, it's plentiful in the interior. We got it all over the place. The downside of it is you do get PM 2.5. <clears throat> White spruce, you're looking at 18.1 million BTUs per cord, so about two thirds of what you'd get from birch. Um, it's considered a softwood, so it burns pretty quickly and you get sap making creosote and it tends to pop and smark, spark when you open the, the door of the wood stove. Um, you're looking at about $300 per cord split and delivered but again you know it's pretty plentiful so you can get it even cheaper than that. Um, <clears throat> just like any other solid fuel you're getting PM 2.5 and the other downside of it is you get the sticky sap from spruce. Cottonwood, you're getting about 15 and a half, or I'm sorry, 14 and a half million BTUs per cord. Uh, so about 60% of that that you'd get with birch. So that in mind, you're cutting, splitting, hauling, and burning almost twice as much wood for just the same amount of heat. Um, it also creates a smoky, smelly burn. Your neighbors are going to complain, um, and it leaves behind more ash than the better woods. Um, for those reasons, usually it's free. I mean, you see posts all over Craigslist and Facebook, free cottonwood, come get it out of my yard. There's a reason for that. Don't, don't buy into the temptation. <clears throat> um, then we come to pellets. You're looking at about 16 million BTUs per ton, so about halfway between cottonwood and spruce. You're looking at about $295 a ton with superior pellets from what I could find. Um, it's convenient that you don't need to cut, split, and stack and store. Uh, you can go fishing all summer, then come September, order and get several tons delivered to your garage. Um, <clears throat> it burns cleaner than cord wood, but you still get PM 2.5 with it. Uh, the big downfall with pellet stoves are most of them require electricity. Uh, so I mean, it kind of rules out the availability as a backup heat source. Um, you're also limited by availability. If nobody in town has pellets, you can't just go out in the forest and cut down a, a, t a bag of pellets. <clears throat> Number one, heating oil. Uh, you're looking at 13.4 million BTUs per 100 gallons. Uh, number two has roughly 13.9 uh, million BTUs, so pretty close. It's most frequently available at fuel that uh, you can find at the U-Haul places, like most of the gas stations that have a heating oil pump. It's number one. Uh, most of the bulk plants are number one as well. And the reason for that is it's more compatible with the above ground tanks. Number two tends to gel up at the extreme cold temperatures. So as a safeguard that most of them are number one. Um, average about 255 per gallon for you hauling your own. Uh, Delivery is more convenient obviously, but you're gonna pay more. Um, it's nice because you don't have to feed the stove twice a day, but the downfall is you gotta make sure you stay on top of keeping the tank full. Uh, and it is more subject to spills and, and leaks. Uh, Fuel lines can be kind of finicky. I mean, if they don't have just the right seal, you're going to get you're going to get vacuum issues. You're going to get leaks. It can be 
it can be expensive when in the middle of the night you got to call the heating company. Um, <clears throat> it's not very volatile, so that's a, a definitely a plus. Um, it actually has to be atomized in order to burn, so I mean it, it's pretty safe fuel in that aspect. It is taxed with HB 158, uh, the refined fuel sur surcharge, which is just under one cent per gallon. Uh, and then you've also got your FOSS charges, which is spill training. Um, it also releases chemicals and precursors to PM 2.5. And then there's ultra low sulfur. Um, <clears throat> from everything we've heard, the EPA really wants us to switch over. Um, and that's based on measures, namely in New England area, uh, the East Coast. It's a lot more abundant there, and they've had a lot of help, a lot of uh, luck with it reducing reducing their PM 2.5 issues. Um, <clears throat> you're looking at estimated between 30 and 40 cents a gallon more, uh, but it does have fewer BTUs, so you're going to use more and more electrical consumption as well. But it is cleaner, so your maintenance costs will be lower. Um, the big issue with this one is the availability. Uh, Petrostar and North Pole isn't currently geared to refine ultra low sulfur, so it has to be trucked up from Valdez. And I don't think, I, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but I know there were several tankers that rolled on the Richardson last year just bringing up Valdez uh, diesel. Um, <clears throat> also, looks like, you know, hopefully you know, a potential compromise would be switching to number one instead of number or instead of ultra-low sulfur, um, which is only 10 cents a gallon more over number two. Propane, you're looking at 9.15 million BTUs per hour, or per 100 gallons, uh, meaning number one is, number one diesel is roughly one and a half times more BTUs than propane. Uh, local pickup, from what I'm finding, is about 289 per gallon. Uh, it's easy to connect to natural gas when the lines show up. <coughs> uh, it only requires minor modifications, basically changing over orifice and whatnot. Um, but changing over from fuel oil is a pretty significant cost. There's a few boilers that you can just change over the burner, but most of them you have to change out the whole boiler. Um, it does burn cleaner than oil and wood, uh, but it's subject to explosion in the event of fire or rupture. <coughs> Electricity, um, <clears throat> it, a lot of people have been told, oh, well, you know, when it's really cold, just turn on electric space heaters, but I mean, we have one of the highest electric rates in the country. Uh, at just over 22 cents per kilowatt hour, it's about two and a quarter times what the national average is. Um, we can get 3,415 BTUs per kilowatt hour. Um, <clears throat> so I know we're kind of starting to get into a broad range of terms as far as how we get our BTUs, but don't worry, I'll come back to that. Um, <clears throat> electric space heaters can be dangerous. Uh, they're common cause of burns and fires. And then the cords cause tripping hazards. Uh, so that's, that's another issue there. Most of our electricity is locally generated using coal or fuel oil. And if, the, and if we have to make the EPA upgrades to the point sources <coughs> excuse me, in the new SIP, you're looking at even higher rates. Uh, it's going to be a substantial bill that's going to have to get passed on somewhere. Uh, oh, sorry. There you go. Um, additionally, we all know electricity is a fairly vulnerable utility. Uh, vehicles, falling trees, windstorms, and freezing rain have proven really good at turning off the lights. Um, sometimes up to a week. Uh, there was a couple, three years ago when we had that big ice storm right around Thanksgiving where Fairbanks, a big chunk of Fairbanks was without power for a week, week and a half. I dealt with a lot of frozen houses during that time. Um, so this is where heat security proves to be really vital. You know, I mean, having a wood stove, you know, if nothing else is a backup is critical in these instances. It can mean the difference between a several thousand dollar heating bill. Um, so I mean, whether it's wood stove, generator, solar backup, you gotta have something. Natural gas, um, <clears throat> looking at about 100,000 BTUs per therm. Uh, again, more terminology. Uh, so to kind of keep it simple, about 
8.2 million BTUs per 100 gallons, which is just shy of a third of what a quart of birch has. Um, it burns the cleanest of all the heat sources so far, uh, but it has some pretty significant downfalls to it. Um, you're looking at lower stack temperature can cause condensation in your chimney. Uh, the sulfur in the exhaust, when it basically comes in contact with moisture, becomes sulfuric acid. It can eat out the steel liner in your chimney and cause it to collapse. Uh, I've had to deal with several of those. Uh, I've also seen issues with ice damming. The lower exhaust temperatures from the gas, it, it condenses at a lower temperature and you start getting ice buildup on roofs and whatnot. It can cause some pretty nasty structural damage there. Um, it requires pretty pricey appliance conversion. Uh, like I say, unless you're already set up with propane, uh, you, nine times out of ten, you're looking at changing out your entire boiler, so about ten to fifteen thousand dollars plus running the lines and hooking up. Uh, most people just don't have that kind of money, so I mean, it, there'd have to be some kind of contingency there. Um, again, it's also subject to rupture and explosion, kind of like propane. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers the 7.1 magnitude earthquake in Kenai back in January 2016. Um, but in the middle of the night, there was a pretty big earthquake, and a few hours later, there were a couple houses where the roofs were blown 40 to 50 feet in the air uh, because there was a gas line rupture that nobody knew about. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and the article from the from ADN even says that nobody was at fault. There was no human error. It's just natural part of gas. I mean, it can be a dangerous thing. I know when I was working on heating systems, oil I knew was pretty safe, pretty predictable. But you know, natural gas, you, you really had to step up your game because it can mean difference in life and death between people. Um, <clears throat> you've also got, I don't know if anybody heard about it, but it was, I think, the day of the last stakeholders group in Boston area, they were I think dozens of homes and structures that got fi had fires and explosions because of an overpressuring event with the gas lines. <clears throat> so we've covered a lot of different terms and numbers and everything and kind of get confusing trying to make sense of it all. Uh, so the big question is, you know, what's it all mean? How does it add up? And what's it going to, how's it going to impact you and your family and how you heat your home? Um, so trying to put it into comparable terms, so we're talking apples and apples instead of you know, therms and cords and gallons and everything else. So if you break it down price per million BTU, you look for birch, you're looking at $14.83 per million. White spruce, $16.57. Pellets, $18.44. Number one heating oil is $19.03. Propane is $31.58 per million BTUs, and electricity is $64.81 per million. That's a pretty big difference. Um, so the next question is, yeah, absolutely. No, this is just the price per million BTU. Uh, as far as the efficiency of the delivery system, that's a whole other factor that I, I didn't have the energy to try to delve into. That's for people much smarter than myself. So <clears throat> I'm just trying to break down price per million BTUs. Mm -hmm. So the average home in the interior, you know, you're looking at, you know, built around the time frame of the pipeline construction. Most of them are two by six construction with uh, wood frame, double pane windows. Nobody cared about how much oil we went through. Nobody cared about how much wood we burned, how dirty it was. Um, most houses built in that time frame with those rem those specifications, you're looking at between 100 and 150 gallons of heating fuel per month in the winter time. Um, <clears throat> mine, I've I've tracked it during the cold snaps, it goes through five to seven gallons a day. Uh, so every time I hear that boiler come on, I just kind of cringe a little bit more because I know that's, that's dollars going out the chimney. Um, I'd love to replace it, but uh, yeah, I don't have that kind of money. 
Um, so if we use kind of a median value of 125 gallons per month, that comes to 16,750,000 BTUs per month that it would take using number one heating oil with the average boiler. <clears throat> so when you get home, take a look at your boiler. Uh, when I was running around town servicing boilers and fixing boilers, the most common one I saw was the Burnham V1 series. Uh, they're kind of a light blue with equal amounts of rust. Um, they've, they've got kind of a black angled steel plate on the front where the burner attaches. Um, the most common one is a V14, so V1 series, four sections or three flueways. Um, again, that's what I've got in my house. Um, so if you look at the data plate on your boiler, whether it's one of these dinosaurs or one of the newer system 2000s, uh, there should be a data plate that goes over this different information. Um, and it goes over the, the capacity and the firing rate and whatnot. Uh, the water MBH that you see uh, under the arrow, that's the BTU output to the system in 1,000 BTUs per hour. Now, keep in mind, that's brand new boiler in a lab under ideal conditions. Um, I don't know of anybody that lives in a lab with a new boiler, but I, you know, they got to do what they got to do. Um, so the oil GPH is how many gallons of oil it's using every hour that that burner is running. Now, now typically your boiler, your burner is not going to run for an hour unless you come home from Thanksgiving dinner at the in-laws and your boiler's out. Um, so typically it runs for, you know, three to five minutes at a time. But next time you hear your boiler come on, look at your watch, look at your phone, see what time it is. When it shuts off, see how long it ran. And then you, before long, you'll start piecing together and seeing how many times has my boiler come on and fire during an hour. And you start doing the numbers and running it and figuring out before long, you'll know just how much fuel you go through every day. And it, it can really be surprising. It won't be long before you start yelling at your teenagers, get out of the shower. <laughs> So to get the same BTU output, and I apologize, this is kind of a hard one to read. I didn't, it looked a lot easier on my computer. I didn't, didn't look at it on a screen. Um, so to get the same BTU output to meet that same demand uh, for Birch, you'd be looking at $248.41 per month. Uh, so for the six month winter, that'd be $1,490 or just less than one dividend. Uh, white spruce, you're looking at 277 62 a month, or 1665 for the winter, just a little more than one dividend. Pellets, 308 83 per month, or 1852 per winter, uh, just a little bit more. <clears throat> Heating oil is 318 per month, or $1,912.50 for the six-month winter. Propane, you'd be looking at, for the same BTUs, you'd be looking at $528.97 per month, or $3,173.82 for the winter. That's you and your spouse's dividend gone, just to heat your home. Electricity, the really scary one, $1,085.59 per month to get the same kind of BTUs. Uh, that's over $6,500 for the winter. That's dividends for an entire family of four. Uh, so any ideas of vacation, don't even think about it. Not going to happen. So, I mean, heating is a, a very essential basic need in our world, just like air, just like food, just like water. And trying to find a balance between those is the hard part. Um, <clears throat> Most Alaskans, you know, we do what we have to to get by. You know, we didn't move to Alaska for the ideal, easy life. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people were raised here. Like I said, myself, I, I, was, I was flown here, not grown here. But we do what we have to to get by. Um, so, you know, it, it's going to be a matter of finding a compromise, being able to keep your family warm, but at the same time, you, your kids, your neighbors, everybody being able to breathe clean air. Uh, I got three kids of my own. You know, they breathe the same air. My neighbors do. I breathe the same air. You know, it, it's it's a tricky situation, but we have to be able to heat our homes and 
we have to be able to breathe. So hopefully we can all work together as a community and find a solution because one side or the other throwing a fit, demanding their way or no way isn't gonna get anywhere. So, any questions? Okay, so I have the microphone back here. Who's got a question? Nick. So hold the questions until we get the microphone in front of you. So our, you got it there, Janet, thanks. That'll work. Until the green light comes on. And uh, thank you, Jesse. You did a very good job of, um, you know, explaining the economics uh, with home heating here. And, uh, you know, I think with the air quality problem, you've been involved in the stakeholder group and, um, you know, you're uh, really coming up to speed with some of the issues. And we, we know that eventually to solve this air quality problem, one of the things that needs to happen is uh, to have a, a shift away from uh, wood burning and solid fuel in conjunction with making sure that we have the, you know, cleanest burning devices out there. And my question is, what do you think is the biggest hurdle um, to, you know, achieving that? Is it, is it the economics uh, that you presented here? Uh, do you think a bigger hurdle is kind of the technological uh, piece and some of the um, issues that you mentioned along with uh, having a backup source of heat? Or um, do you feel that it's uh, the social norm and, it, you know, that's just the way that society works? Out of those three, what's your opinion of the, of the biggest hurdle? Honestly, I would say probably economics would be the biggest thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, in, in, my, in my interactions with people on the wood burning pages and whatnot, economics is always seems to be the biggest issue. And until there's an economic alternative, it's going to be really hard to get people to quit burning wood. I know personally I'd, I'd much rather go spend my summers doing fun stuff, you know, but instead, you know, I... I live within a budget, so I spend a lot of my summers cutting firewood so that I can heat my home economically. And at this point, we just, we don't have an economical alternative. So. Another question from this side of the room, Brittany. Thank you, Jesse, and yes, I do understand the advocate that you have been for the wood burning community. And following up on the answer you just provided, um, as a borough, we are trying to provide some incentives to help people get more efficient devices, maybe make switches, and try and really help um, with those change outs. Uh, how do you feel we could be more effective in that program to get cleaner uh, devices out into the community? Or what are some of the barriers to that people may be um, the reasons for why they aren't participating in some of those programs? Honestly, that's a good question. One that I still have yet to figure out. Um, <clears throat> you know, because it, there's some pretty good incentives out there, some pretty good programs that you know, if you just utilize it, it, it helps. Uh, but there's kind of been some point in time there's there's been a breakdown in communication and trust issues developed and it, it's it's really thrown a wrench in the works um, so hopefully we can start getting people to see that you know it, it, communicating and working together you know it, it's gonna be the only way to go forward because like I say both sides kicking and screaming it's it's not gonna get anywhere it's not gonna benefit anybody so hopefully Um, thank you. Uh, first off, I, I just want to let you know you weren't late, you were early, or at least by the agenda I have here. And thank you for the presentation, it was great. Um, on the, it, I, I've got a couple of questions, but on the economic side of things, and this isn't, wasn't directly related to your presentation, but, so, I mean, there's an economic argument for burning wood, a very good one, but there's also, I feel, a lot of, um, pushback from the wood burning community when the borough makes an exemption for economic hardship for no ash. And I see that as being, like that economic exemption in the no ash as being limiting government's role, making, increasing freedom for people. But I, and so I, I, but I feel like the wood burning community, or at least a very vocal part of the wood burning community, <clears throat> views that as being overly restrictive and if you have any insight as to how we can 
bridge that gap, I would be really grateful for that. Actually, that was a discussion that I was having just this morning. Um, <clears throat> and you're right. Uh, you know, one of the determining factors that can be used for qualifying for NOAASH is economic. Mm -hmm. And whether part of it was, you know, lack of clarification, people didn't know exactly what that economic hardship required, you know, I don't know what the, the issue was, what the hang up was, but a lot of people perceived it as, you know, having to come with hat in hand saying, you know, I can't afford to heat my home. And there, was, there wasn't enough clarification that the borough doesn't want pay stubs. They don't want tax returns. This is actually a conversation I had with Nick at one of the stakeholder groups a couple months back. You know, they're not asking for that kind of financial information. They're simply asking, do you qualify for Denali Kid Care or WIC or heating assistance? You know, it, it, and some people find that asking that question is intrusive, but I kind of have to wonder, do they also find it intrusive when they swipe a food stamp card, when they order fuel to be delivered, paid for by the heating assistance program, when they pick up prescriptions using a Denali Kid Care card? Uh, Heating your home is just as important as food stamps or medications for your children. So, you know, I know as a parent, there's nothing that I'd stop at in order to ensure my kids were taken care of. And if it meant that I had to answer, yes, I get this program, or yes, I receive that benefit, well, you know what, suck it up. Um, but the reality is the borough's not asking for detailed personal information. Um, you know, so I, and I've actually had a discussion with some of the members of the wood-burning community kind of clarifying and e explaining to them what I learned from Nick in that conversation. So, <clears throat> yes, there's definitely some very passionate, hardline folks in the wood-burning community. Uh, honestly, some that you could give a $20 bill and they'd wrinkle, they'd complain because it had a wrinkle. Uh, but most of them want to do the right thing. They're pretty reasonable people. Reasonable people. Most of them have new, clean, modern stoves. There's a few that you know have the old barrel stoves, and they're they're going to burn what they want when they want. They don't care. Uh, I've you know there's been times where I see people selling old barrel stoves on Craigslist or on Facebook, and I, I comment on there, you know, come on, you know, get real. You know, wood burners are having a hard enough time as it is without selling junk like that to make the problem worse. Uh, so, like I say, I mean, most, most of the wood-burning community is good, reasonable people, just trying to do the right thing, just trying to get by, you know, just like most Alaskans. So, if we can get the information out there and clarify the requirements for these programs, I, I think that'd go a long way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jesse, thank you so much. Um, I've grown to respect and admire you over the months that we've worked together in the stakeholders group. and. And I've learned again from you today with the data that you've presented. Um, and, and I think you're right. This is a really tricky situation, and more data kind of helps clarify things and makes this whole situation more clear. Uh, I have more of a comment. And <clears throat> you know, yesterday there was a comment about um, the curtailment is bankrupting people. And I spent quite a bit of time last night and, and this morning kind of looking for data and, and, and what that could mean um, and curtailment and bankrupt and, and all that and then the data you present here today. Um, and I, I just want to share some facts uh, to, to kind of <clears throat> add on to that. So the state of Alaska in 2016 said that respiratory related um, diagnoses were the number four cause of hospitalization in the state. And the average bill charge for those hospitalizations was $51,774. Last year, there were 28 days where a stage two alert was called. And uh, I think um, some research that's done here in the borough suggested that the average home burns about four and a half gallons of heating oil on a day uh, in the winter. And so if you do the math, um, you know, those 28 days would cost you $378 to switch to heating oil, from wood to heating oil. So 
I, I, that data was really powerful for me when we talk about economics. So, you know, if if you're if you had the option to not burn wood for 28 days, that would cost you an additional $378 um, if you use those averages. And then, you know, if you ended up having to go to the hospital for a respiratory illness, you could, you know, on average pay $51,000. So I think that data also uh, doesn't get brought in the conversation enough. So I just wanted to offer that up for everybody. Absolutely right. And, and I'll be the first to admit, you know, I do not know medical stuff very well. Uh, <clears throat> so that's why I didn't include that because there's it's such a wide array of information that could be thrown in there. I myself, I've got respiratory issues from open burn pits in Iraq. So I get it. Air is a big deal. You know, I mean, if you can't breathe, you know, nothing else is going to matter for long. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, and to kind of go along with your your comment about the difference in price part of it comes back to mayor castle's comment or question about the delivery of the heat uh, with a boiler for example that heat goes into a roughly 250 pound chunk of cast iron filled with 15 gallons of water and gets pumped out and delivered slowly versus a wood stove almost all that heat gets pumped into the living space instantly so you know it, it is, it's a complex issue, and absolutely medical issues are expensive. So it's just, it's, it's a big mess full of all kinds of questions. So hopefully we can kind of put them all together and get somewhere with it. Yeah, Jesse, I just had a couple comments. Number one, I really appreciate this slide. This is awesome. Thank I you. think the one thing to add in there is, this is purchased wood. Correct. This That's is purchased. Just purchased. This isn't That's not you going you out buy. and bucking it up yourself. Exactly. For you know a hundred bucks. This right. is this is paying for every quart. Correct. So uh, that's something to take into mind. But this is an awesome slide that most Alaskans are going to understand. Thank you. And then I had one comment about the medical thing, and and I have kids that have asthma, and I, my wife has asthma. And one thing I would say about the medical problem is, when we get those very cold temperatures, that's when their asthma really kicks in. It's not necessarily the PM 2.5. It's the cold that gets Absolutely. into their lungs. When they're outside, they have problems. When they're inside, they're fine. Yeah. So that's just another factor that I think that we need to look at. Is it actually the PM 2.5 or is it the cold that's the problem? Well, and, and there's been plenty of times when I was in the Army, you know, running it, you know, 20, 30 below. Yeah, cold air hurts. Uh, it, it could be the cleanest cold air. It's still going to hurt. Um, but the reality, whether you think the PM 2.5 is, you know, the cause of the issues or not, PM 2.5 is a problem, uh, if nothing else, because the EPA has said it is. And it all comes down to whether you believe the science or not, up above says that we got to address it. So. Okay, so we got um, about six minutes before Glenn and his crew uh, show us the wood burning demos. We got um, a couple questions at this table. Um, I have two comments and one question. Okay. And um, you did a great <clears throat> job, Jesse, really. Thank you. Um, so, one of the major causes, causes nationwide of bankruptcy is medical costs, especially if people have major heart or strokes or cancers. Um, the second thing is uh, the the, a lot of people who have asthma, the cold air brings on a reactive uh, air disease in the upper part of the respiratory tract in the bronchi. And so that's one effect definitely in the winter with the cold air. The PM 2.5, you know, is, gets down lower and that's the inflammatory process. So you've got kind of two different things going on at that time. Um, and the, the one thing that has struck me, the, the um, wood burners in our community that are involved in these discussions and the stakeholders groups and coming to these conferences, they're all burning the best technology that they can afford at this time. 
And it's got to be incredibly frustrating to you. And, and, and many of them are you know, business people. I mean, the, the most forthcoming solutions in the stakeholders group has been from the wood burning community or wood production community. They've gone further than a lot of other people in their recommendations because they're, they're afraid they're going to lose that. And it's just got to be, and, we may, and everybody may not be able to burn all the time what they want to do, you know, or heat the way they, they want to. But it's got to be incredibly, incredibly frustrating for you guys to have a bunch of people out there who are just stubbornly saying, we are not changing, nobody's going to tell me what to do, I'm not paying an extra penny, you know, regardless of how it affects anybody else. And to make changes yourselves so that your family will be healthier when everybody around you is just spewing stuff that you know is giving all wood burners a bad name and, and our community a bad name. And, you know, I just don't, I mean, some of you, I, I just don't know how if, if the, I don't want to say, uh, you know, if the people that are doing everything they can to sustain as much of our, the wood stove culture as possible, I can't communicate to the people who don't want to make any changes. That is a huge barrier. I, you know, it's got to be incredibly frustrating. It is for all of us. It really is. And honestly, you know, my biggest aha throughout the entire process of the stakeholders group was, honestly, I really underestimated how difficult it was going to be to represent the wood burning community. Um, you've got some very, very passionate, involved people who have educated themselves just enough to, you know, see their, argue their side, and you've got, you know, you've got the opposite end who, you know, are say, well, you know, I, I like to be able to burn wood, but, you know, at the same time, you know, I, I can make changes. I can, I can adjust. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's been very trying. I'll be the first to admit that. Um, you know, some of you in this room know that I've been one of the very vocal, outspoken individuals in this fight uh, for a little bit now. And it's just, it, I was one of those hardline, adamant, no, I'm going to burn wood because this is what I have to do to heat my home. Um, you know, part of that was because, you know, I've got one of those 35-year-old dinosaur boilers, and I know not only what it's using every day, but also what it's putting out versus my three-year-old catalytic wood stove. Um, so I mean, it, it's one of those, every situation is different. Uh, but it, it is, it's, it's been very challenging. And I, I hope that we can get more people to come around and see that, you know, demanding everything or nothing, you're gonna walk away with nothing. You know, there's gonna have to be compromise on all sides. So. Hi, Jesse. I'm Tim Hamlin. I'm with EPA out of Seattle. It's good to, good to see you up here. I'm glad you're, I really appreciate your engagement uh, with the stakeholder group and, uh, and your presentation today. Uh, like Jimmy, I was starting to run some of the numbers and it made me start to feel sort of like, you know, just from a pure financial perspective, this doesn't look like that hard a problem to solve. It's a challenging one, but it seems less challenging. And then you started talking about the energy efficiency of the boilers, and I thought, oh, maybe it's harder than I thought. Um, but um, but that, that it, what I, um, I guess it's a, not a question, maybe more of a pitch. I, I really appreciate um, your engagement, and um, uh, I'm, I'll be interested in, in your thoughts as this effort continues to move forward. Um, I hear the comment that it's mostly financial, and I have to tell you, I'm a little dubious. It feels like there, it's as much, no one's going to tell me what to do, especially the government, and I don't really trust their numbers, and I don't accept that PM 2.5 is a problem. I, I, if it were just economic, we would, we would, I think, be further along in the discussion and the mutual understanding of the pros and cons. And, and just talking about the health effects for a moment, I think there's probably a pretty good case from a societal perspective that the uh, health effects end up costing more than, than burning wood gets you in, in cheap heat. Um, but of course, that's not distributed perfectly. <laughs> uh, and it's not, uh, you know, the time, uh, the, you know, 
people know how much it's costing to heat their homes. They don't necessarily know what it may be costing for their health or their neighbor's health. And I know you get that. Um, but I, I, I just really hope we can, you know, there's so much distrust between people who work for the government and the, and the communities they serve and, uh, and then amongst the various community groups. Um, things are starting to move in the right direction here in, in the borough uh, because, because people like you are engaged. So just thanks, and, and if you have thoughts about how much is financial and how much is the rest of it that I just alluded to and what we can do about that, I'd love to hear them. I don't know if you're planning to stay for lunch, but I'd love to get your thoughts on that. Uh, last comment, um, I just wanted to, uh, I know maybe for most people in the room, I, I saw your slide on the ULSD and the bullet, EPA wants it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but let me put that into context. Um, it's not so much EPA wants it, it's that the frame of reference we use now that we're in a serious designation is anything that's worked anywhere else needs to be looked at and considered as part of a serious SIP. Um, there's, that doesn't automatically mean it has to be included, but it definitely has to be analyzed. And I just want that nuance, I, I offer that nuance in part because um, when I think when some people hear EPA wants it, they already have the big bad EPA in their heads and think there must not be, a, can't possibly be a good reason they want it and there can't possibly be any way to talk them out of it. And um, uh, it, it's, it's obviously, I know you know, but it, it's more complicated than that and, and that's why working together uh, is so important. So thanks for the opportunity. And you're right, and, and I've, I've actually had that conversation with a lot of the wood burning community that, you know, with this list of measures that the stakeholders group has had to look at, you know, now that we're in a serious SIP, I've tried to explain to them that, you know, since we're in a serious SIP now, we have to look at all these measures that have been used in the lower 48, and unless we can rule them out either economically or technically infeasible, we're pretty well stuck with it. Uh, that's like, you know, the registration matter, you know, Oh, the, the, the number of people up in arms over that. Um, <clears throat> but it's just trying to explain to them that, you know, you can't rule that out, whether based on technically or economically infeasible. Um, the ultra low sulfur is one of those things that, you know, I've explained to them that we kind of can, you know, pretty well rule that out just because of nothing else, the fact that we've got to truck it all up from Valdez. And, and even if they were making it locally, you know, 40 cents a gallon more, when you look at the number of gallons of fuel used a month, it adds up a lot. So, like I say, it's, you're right. Uh, the way I word that, yeah, I probably, probably could have done that a little bit better, but, but yeah, it's just, yeah, it's been a challenging ordeal. So I'm, I'm ready for the stakeholders group to be done over so I can just go back to minding my own business. I, it's been an enlightening process. I've learned a lot, met a lot of great people, but I'm ready to just go do my thing, so. Okay, well, let's give it up for Jesse Shev. Thank you, Jesse. So, we, uh, we're slightly behind schedule. Thank you for the good discussion. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break, so I'm going to rally you guys back in here in okay, Jim? 11 minutes. Jim? Glenn, you have 30 seconds. Go. So let me just, uh, so everyone here isn't asking the same questions outside. Uh, if you're going to go see the burn demo, we have two stoves out there that are currently being burned. They're identical stoves. They're EPA certified. One stove on the right has wet wood, was loaded 30 minutes ago, the stove on the left was loaded with dry wood, the same amount of wood after we built a coal bed. Um, because it is raining, you can view it through the window if you like. You can see the difference in opacity. I'll let you see for yourself. But I just want to let you know that the wood that we loaded on the left was 17% moisture content, 15%, I'm sorry, 15% moisture content. The stove that's on the right, yesterday the wood was at 28% because it sat out in the rain, this is why you don't want to leave your wood out in the rain, is now 42%. I'll let you see the difference for yourself, but you owe it to yourself to go outside and look at the graph in front of the stoves and see the difference in the heat output between wood that's 15% and 42%. Yes. No, well, no, Dan Brown is now. Yeah, I want to be at 80s and get it teed up. Oh. Could you email it to me? Um, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just a step behind here. 
all of the presentations are
Okay, everybody, we got about two minutes. I know it's a short break, so if you want to start making your way back, I'll go around and start at updating folks. Yeah, yeah, I realized I hadn't printed it. Oh, you have it, okay. Yeah, right. You just put it up here. And I'll... Oops, here, you take this, let me get rid of this. It's kind of a Fairbanks PM program manager. Okay. How about I write it on there? I got it. I'll just okay. write it right there. Yeah. And so.
let's get started here. So while I'm introducing our next speaker, I thought for a second I was going to have to do his presentation because I didn't know where he got off to. So, I'll do it for him. Okay. All right, so moving on here on our schedule. So next year, I think a lesson learned is all the sidebar conversations that are going on seem to be pretty valuable. So we'll maybe plug some more time for that next year, Nick. Yeah, a little more time for the sidebars. Okay. Okay, so uh, coming up next is Dan Brown. And Dan Brown is the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA uh, program manager for PM 2.5 for Fairbanks. So he's dedicated to us. Um, real quick background on Dan. Dan has spent the past 25 years working for the US EPA in both national and regional offices, implementing voluntary and regulatory programs to reduce air pollution from energy, industrial, and transportation sector sources. He works for the EPA Region 10 office, helping coordinate work on the Fairbanks non-attainment area and also leading the region's work on the West Coast Collaborative and Georgia Basin Puget Sound International Airshed. He has a master's degree in environmental science and engineering and a bachelor's of science in civil engineering and has an AEE and is an AEE certified energy manager. Please welcome Dan Brown. So you got uh, I was fascinated by the uh, by the wet wood uh, versus dry wood demonstration out there. If you if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Uh, I'm also fascinated by uh, people like uh, like Wendy and Jesse who get up here and they say, "Oh, I'm I'm uh, I'm not very uh, used to giving these presentations." And so please forgive me. And meanwhile, I'm sitting there saying, holy crap, these guys are going to make me look horrible. Because <laughs> they got way more interesting stuff to say than, than I do. I'm, I'm sort of here kind of given the old uh, broken record pitch that, uh, that we still have an air quality problem here in Fairbanks. Uh, and we still have a long way to go to get there. And, uh, and so uh, thanks to uh, people like Wendy and Jesse for uh, giving you guys all much better uh, uh, eye candy and uh, information than I'm probably going to. Um, so with that said, uh, thanks for that uh, overly optimistic introduction, and I'll just uh, figure out how to run this thing, and, um, and oh, there we go, okay. Gotcha, thanks. Um, so a quick outline of, uh, of what I'm going to cover is uh, talk a little bit about EPA's role. Uh, of course, talk about why we're here, which is the health effects, uh, the magnitude of the problem in Fairbanks, and then some of the solutions uh, that we think uh, are great to see the stakeholders kind of come into consensus on uh, and moving forward on, and then, uh, and then of course, my broken record message of its past time to, uh, to get serious about this. <laughs> that, that picture comes, uh, well, you guys know the Rocky movie, so it needs no introduction, but my uh, superstar Justin Spinello over here came up with that one. Um, so again, EPA's role, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's funny because uh, Yes, EPA does set these health-based air quality standards, but uh, it's, it's really important for people to understand it's sort of, all we're doing is we're looking at this broad uh, breadth of health-based research uh, that are done by people who are way, way smarter than me. I mean, these are medical professionals using epidemiological data uh, and producing very robust studies that are peer reviewed by other professionals in the field and, and they, they come to consensus on uh, the health effects from PM. All EPA is doing is sort of gathering that information uh, in a package that we put out to the public and say, hey, this is our assessment of the health-based research uh, and this is what we think is the level that's going to protect people's health. And then there's a whole debate of push back and push forward and we settle on a number. And then once that number becomes finalized, then that's when Congress tells us, EPA, I work for you guys, 
uh, and my job is to implement the rules Congress established, which is once we set this level, now we gotta make sure uh, that states and shops like Denise uh, are out there monitoring the air pollution where there are, where there are populations and, uh, and then making sure as they monitor that air uh, that it meets and attains the air quality standards. Um, so that's, that's the big picture. Uh, and our role here in Fairbanks, it's, it's no different than that. Um, we, we have the standard, uh, we have the monitors, and we know we have an air quality problem, and so we're obligated uh, under the Clean Air Act to make sure that you all and all the other residents of this area can breathe healthy air. That's our, that's our mission. Uh, if I don't succeed, then, uh, oh, well, my boss isn't here anymore, so uh, maybe I can get off easy. Um, and, um, you know, we, we I, I, I'm, I work in the region, so I'm a little closer to the, to the uniqueness of the problem here. I have been up here several times. Many of you have seen me up here several times. I've sat in assembly meetings. I've, I've come to uh, uh, town hall meetings. And, and here I am today. Um, and then we did get somebody from our DC office up here yesterday. Um, and you keep hearing us say, local solutions work best. And, and they do. I mean, you know, we're not here to figure out what works best. It's people like Glenn who said he's driving around seeing, you know, plumes of smoke coming out of chimneys and knowing from his experience in the community and as a wood burner, that that's wet wood. You know, that shouldn't be happening. That's a big part of the problem here. It's just the community recognizing and seeing uh, where the big sources of PM are coming from and coming together to, to make them go away. And so you guys can do that way better than, than we can. Uh, and so, I, uh, so we, we, we support that effort. We're here to support that effort. Uh, we share success stories, we share technical support. Uh, we've been working a lot with the borough, for example, on uh, supporting this ESP concept. If, if, the, if EPA was, was running a curtailment program up here, we would not be talking about ESPs. That's, you know, that is, that's not something that we do at the federal level. But if the borough wants to sort of bring that forward, we can provide technical assistance and help uh, to see how that works and uh, how that could be implemented into a local program. And of course, funding support. You know, we, uh, Jesse was talking about how he can't afford uh, to buy a, uh, a new boiler, and heck, I couldn't either, but um, the idea behind our targeted airshed grants and, uh, and some of these wood stove uh, change out programs that we're helping to fund uh, through ADEC to the borough, or to, or to help people get there, you know, by giving some incentive money to help them exchange some of these high pollutant devices for cleaner pollutant devices. Um, so, of course, health effects is why we're here. Uh, I hope folks, a lot of you were here yesterday and got to see the video. Uh, I think Dr. Hanley's uh, YouTube video, uh, What We Breathe Matters, is, is something that uh, is useful for everybody to watch, and I'm, I'm not even gonna pretend to cover it as well as he, uh, but I basically have two slides, right? One is, how does this PM uh, get into our lungs and our blood? And basically, it's really tiny. Uh, if you pull out an average human hair and look at the, the cross section of that, the diameter of that, that's about on average 50 to 70 micrometers or, or, or micrometers. So we're talking about uh, a particle that's 2.5, so about 25 of those can fit across the width of a human hair. And that's the high end of the range. We're talking about PM 2.5 is the big stuff and everything below that. Uh, so it's really, really tiny. So it bypasses all of our built-in filters to help us stay healthy. And it lands deep into the recesses of our lungs and crosses in, into that sort of lung blood barrier and gets into the blood. Now the blood brings oxygen to all your critical organs. 
and, and now it's also bringing uh, particulate matter along with it. And so what are the health consequences of that? It's, uh, you know, they decrease the lung function, uh, they increase respiratory systems, increase chronic bronchitis, heartbeat irregularities, heart attacks, uh, and can result in premature death. Um, and of course, it's especially true for sensitive populations such as the young uh, and the old, and people who already have uh, compromised health. So, um, so moving to sort of the magnitude of the problem in Fairbanks, uh, as far as looking at the U.S., uh, it does have, uh, it does continue to have uh, the highest concentrations of, uh, of particulate matter uh, in the country. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about design values. There's been some discussion in the press about, well, is the air getting better or is it getting worse? Are there more days? Are there less days? So it's, it's the way that EPA measures this is, is by these design values. And basically, the design values are, are an average over multiple years. Uh, and these, are, these averages are over three years. And, and what we're averaging is the 98th uh, percentile. So for example, if you measured air quality on 360, whoo, 365 days, so took a sample every day, then the 98th percentile would be about the eighth highest. So if you went to the worst and you counted down eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, that's, that's roughly the 98th percentile, whatever that value is. And so if you then take that for, in this case, in the, in the table on the, uh, on the left, uh, if you take that for the year 2015, 16, and 17, so you take those three values and average them together, uh, for Fairbanks, you're at 85 micrograms uh, per meter cube. And, uh, and you can see, you know, the, what's, what's coming up in second here is San Joaquin Valley, uh, and then we have Oak Ridge, and then a couple other uh, folks getting down closer to the standard. Now, the standard is 35, okay? So, so when we say, you know, these local measures are working, uh, well, the design value shows us that we are making progress, okay? We're back when we were looking at the average from 2013 to 2015, uh, we were at 124. Now we're looking at the average of 2015 to 2017, and we're down to 85, okay? So things are working. We have a long way to go. We got to get down to 35. Uh, micrograms per meter cube. So we're still more than two times uh, the national ambient air quality standard, which is, you know, our, our sort of gauge of are we keeping you all healthy? Right now, we're not keeping you healthy. We got to get down there. Um, this is just uh, Barbara Trost, who was here yesterday, gave an excellent presentation about the air quality monitoring work the state is doing. Uh, it's great. They're really trying to make sure that all the neighborhoods uh, in the community are being represented in the work they do uh, to ensure that everybody's breathing healthy air. Uh, so the monitors are the ones that are sort of called out here with the boxes. You got a couple in the in the downtown Fairbanks area, uh, and then you have the North Pole Fire Station. So there's a lot more other monitors and monitoring work out there. These are currently the three uh, regulatory monitors, meaning these are the sites where we're pulling these samples from to calculate these design values. And as I move forward and refer to the design values, even the ones I was referring to earlier, those are really uh, focused on North Pole because currently that's where we're monitoring sort of a neighborhood level concentration. And, uh, and that's where we're trying to ensure the protection of, uh, of communities using that monitor. Uh, so how do we solve the air quality problem? Um, did I say that uh, we think local solutions work best? Um, it's, it's stakeholders, it's people like Jesse getting up here and working with Brian and, and working with the point sources and, and, and pulling the community together to help 
figure out what's going to work the best uh, in this community. Um, and uh, in, in this, you know, this works. Uh, we've seen this approach work. Uh, just in our own region, we have uh, three other attainment areas, uh, non-attainment areas in Tacoma, Washington, and, uh, and Klamath in Oak Ridge, Oregon, two different ones in Oregon, and another one in West Silver Valley, uh, where, where people working together uh, are coming up with solutions and they're working. Uh, so that path, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the path in the Clean Air Act later, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but the, the, the path that is laid out by Congress in the Clean Air Act says that, you know, the state is required to submit a plan uh, to us, and we call this a state implementation plan. Sometimes you hear us use the word SIP, um, and, um, and that has to show how the community is going to reach uh, attainment. Um, and to do that, uh, it needs to adopt control measures, uh, so measures uh, that are going to reduce uh, pollution. And so, uh, and so, what? What? Uh, how do you figure out what control measures are going to work best? Um, well, you try to figure out what the source of the pollution is, what all the sources of pollution are, and then particularly which ones are uh, contributing uh, to the non-attainment problem. And so, how do we learn about that? Well. Uh, we do emission inventories, which offer sort of high-level picture of what are all the sources of pollution that could potentially be uh, contributing to this problem. And then another thing that we look at, which gives us a little finer scale, is, uh, is speciation data. Uh, so it's really, let's pull the pollution from the area and look at it. And so this, this little gra uh, image up here uh, on the on the uh, on the left hand side is a PM filter uh, that came out of a, a monitoring location. And remember these remember how small we talked about how these things are. So you can't see these particles, um, but after pulling a 24-hour sample through a filter, if you have enough of them that are building up onto a filter, now you can see them. And so that's the kind of stuff that's ending up deep down in your lung and into your bloodstream in some cases. Uh, and so we can take that and we can analyze it. And, uh, and the state has spent a considerable amount of time doing this, uh, trying to understand the source contribution. Like, all right, we have that, where did it come from? And there are different ways uh, to do that that are done by people who are way smarter than me, uh, using all kinds of sort of, you know, chemistry and whatnot. Uh, and, and when we look at and assess the results of all that data, and different methods give you different ranges, so it's, you know, it's, nothing is perfect in the world, and, and so we're looking at a whole bunch of different ways to look at that. And so we have these big ranges, like, well, it could be 65 to 85 percent. And so we say, well, about 75 percent of that is coming from wood smoke. Uh, and so we have a pretty good dialed in understanding of uh, the larger uh, contributions to the uh, PM non-attainment area here in, uh, in Fairbanks and North Pole. Um, so since wood smoke is the uh, primary cause of the air quality violations, uh, control measures uh, for wood smoke are, are necessary. Um, and this is why the borough at the local level has adopted and is implementing its curtailment program. I mean, this is, this is a critical uh, and essential part of the solution. It's not the only part, but it is uh, probably the most important part of the solution. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's not just wood smoke. I mean, the state is uh, completing a, a comprehensive evaluation of every source of pollution in the non-attainment area and is looking at best available control measures for, for all of those sources. So every little bit is going to help, um, but curtailment is, it's not, it's not going away. It's, 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 it, it is absolutely essential, uh, as we have seen in just about every other area in the country that has the same problem as you have here, which is stagnant air during inversions and a lot of residential heating with wood. This, this 
I, it, you know, it, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it's colder up here and you have more severe stagnation events and it is not unique. I mean, we have this problem across the country and every other area of the country is well on their way to solving this problem with its locally implemented curtailment program. It works. Of these areas, uh, seven here, five of them are already showing uh, clean air data. And so curtailment isn't going away. It's, it's necessary to, uh, to bring this community uh, to breathing healthy air. Um, you know, and it's a bumpy, it's a bumpy road. I loved, I loved, uh, uh, oh my God, yeah, well, thank you. Wendy's slide yesterday, you know, it said like, you know, expectation, this nice straight line and reality is like this crevices and, and I, oh, that supports my bumpy road slide. Uh, it, it is a bumpy road. I mean, these things aren't easy. You know, it's, people need to heat their homes, absolutely. People can heat their homes two different ways. I just looked at it five minutes ago. One way was nice, hot, warm, and hardly any emissions coming out of the stack. The other way was horrible. Um, and it's still happening up here. I mean, people are still burning wet wood. It's, it's, uh, it, that needs to stop. I mean, people need to figure out how to heat their home more efficiently and more cleanly. That's how we're all gonna be able to go home that's how Jesse's going to get out of continuing to work on the stakeholder group uh, and everybody else as well. That's, that's our goalpost. We need to burn clean, keep our houses warm uh, as cleanly as we can. And, uh, and, <laughs> and I'll tell you, the, you, know, you folks are in charge of your own destiny. Um, I understand that there's a vote on the ballot that would sort of take implementation of this program away from the borough and potentially give it to the state or EPA? I mean, seriously? I mean, that is the last place I wanna go. I don't have a choice. You know, Congress is gonna force us, if the borough isn't doing it and the state isn't doing it, EPA is gonna be in here doing it. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Uh, the borough is working very effectively with the community. Uh, they're already looking at ESPs, like I said earlier. That's not going to happen if, uh, if EPA is in here running a program. So uh, your, uh, your destiny is in your own hands, and uh, I'd, uh, I'd like you to think about that vote as a vote on who is going to be implementing the curtailment program, because it's not going to make the curtailment program go away. All right, sorry. I got a little off track there because I definitely don't want to be implementing a curtailment program. Um, so we're committed to the success locally. Uh, we have funding, uh, we have resources, and we're gonna continue uh, to the best of our ability to ensure success here in Fairbanks locally. Uh, okay, now the, the real boring stuff. Uh, about slides and timing and whatnot. Um, this is sort of the schedule and the process flow as dictated by Congress in the Clean Air Act. Uh, so back in 2009, uh, we EPA designated Fairbanks as well as 30 other areas of the country uh, as non-attainment of the uh, ambient air quality standards for PM 2.5. Um, so, uh, so that gave all of these areas uh, five years uh, to develop a plan, how they were gonna implement reasonably available control measures uh, to bring the areas into attainment. Um, and uh, it didn't happen here, we all know that. We're still very far uh, away from getting there. And so, uh, so EPA uh, made a determination that uh, the area failed to meet the standard. And uh, I, think, I think we had about three or four other areas in addition to Fairbanks that didn't make that target. And so we bumped them up, which means we, we 
we classify them as serious non-attainment instead of moderate non-attainment. And so what that means is, uh, in addition to those control measures that they had submitted in their moderate plan, now they have to adopt a stepwise increasing number of control measures uh, in order to show attainment at the future date, which is currently uh, December uh, 2019. Now we did we did approve uh, the uh, the state's moderate area SIP in uh, September of 2017, and that's that's where the that's where uh, the initial version of the curtailment program lies. And 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 so when I talk about you know federal you know, EPA coming in to enforce that. Uh, the, the way this process works is when a state puts all these control measures uh, in its plan and submits it to us and we approve it. It's a very formal process. We put it out there for public comment. Anybody in this room could comment and say, you know, that's good, that's bad, this is why. We consider all that, we finally approve it. Once we approve it, everything in that plan now is federally enforceable. Uh, that's so so that's why I say You know, I, I feel like I'm getting boxed into a corner here uh, The last thing I want to do is be up here uh, Enforcing a curtailment program, but by law That's what would have to happen if the borough wasn't doing it and that the state failed to do it uh, Then it's it's beholden to us because that is a federally enforceable control measure right now today and 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 that's that's the situation. Um, so sorry, uh, am I a little bit passionate about how much I don't want to come up here and enforce that curtailment <laughs> program? <laughs> um, my boss is sitting over there, and we were in the borough. I'm going to do a little sidetrack. Uh, sorry, Jim, if it gets us off schedule, but. They have all these uh, foreclosed properties in the uh, in the borough now, and Tim said, "Well, hey, maybe it's time to start looking at some uh, some property for yourself over there." <laughs> um, not that I don't love this community; it's beautiful. Uh, I managed to spend a little bit of time. Uh, I've been up here for ten days, uh, assembly meeting and stakeholder meeting last week, and and I figured, well. Why, uh, why waste uh, your money and my money as taxpayers uh, paying for air travel to get me back home when I'm just gonna have to fly back up the next week? Uh, so I spent, I spent a couple days hanging around and, and made it down to Denali, and God, it is so beautiful up here. Vast, the colors, the animals. Man, no wonder. Um, so sorry about that divergence. Uh, we finalized our fa finding of failure to attain in 2017. Um, that sort of kicked in this next phase of, you know, step it up, step it up, more controls, more timelines. Uh, we had a SIP due date of December uh, 2017, uh, which has come and gone, but the reason why that's come and gone is because the state, you know, the state told us, hey, you know, we're not going to make attainment by December 2019. Um, that's how far we got to go. We've got a lot of pushback in the community. We're just not making a lot of progress. We're going to have to ask for an extension. And so this is sort of, you know, this is the kind of flexibility that we talk about when, uh, you know, when people say that, you know, EPA is coming in and they're not allowing anybody to do anything, but the rule says, well, it's not really true. There's a lot of behind the scenes uh, pushback on us, and we try to accommodate as much of that as we can, given the uniqueness of the situation. But you got to realize that as unique as the situation is here, it's not a unique situation that we have non-attainment areas and that state and local agencies need to solve them. We do this all over the country. And so there's only so far we can go because you give an inch here, somebody over here in the lower 48 is gonna take advantage of that. 
you know, even though it's well justified for the unique situation here, you know, it doesn't matter. Once, it's, once the precedent is established, that becomes the sort of, you know, lowest denominator. There's other people all over this country that want breaks. You know, I want a break. You know, if I get pulled over for speeding, hey, officer, I was just trying to get to where I needed to go fast. But, you know, it's, 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 so it's this delicate balance of uh, finding the flexibility at the local level while meeting the law. You know, we have laws. We get sued all the time for giving people too much flexibility. That happened here. We were giving the state a lot of flexibility on the timing uh, to submit their uh, moderate plan, and we got sued. EPA, you're not doing your job. You got to you got to get the state to get their plan in here. Uh, so it's, it's a delicate balance, and we're doing the best we can, working with Carl, working with Denise, working with the community, working with Brian and the stakeholder group, but we need to cross the finish line. We do not have that much flexibility. Um, the other important point on this slide is another thing I hear about, oh, Maybe I changed the slide already. Uh, this last bullet um, sort of addresses this. Well, you know, the borough, they keep, in the state, they keep, you know, tightening things up. And it, yeah, they do, because we're not making any progress on solving the problem. Again, this is, this is the clean, this is Congress. You know, they basically say, here is, it, and it's pretty fair, you know, this is, you got five years, if you don't get there by five years, then we'll give you another five years, but you got to do more, you know, and if you can't get there in that five years, then you're going to fail to attain, and you got to do even more on top of that. There's, as bad as it is now, there is still another level of incremental increases on control measures that we haven't got to yet, and we're at the point where we're trying to avoid going there. Uh, by getting a sip in the door with control measures that are going to get us to attainment. Um, so yes, it's, it's ramping up. Things are getting more stringent. And people are still burning wet wood. It's got to stop or it's going to get worse. So I've been warn warned uh, not to try to predict any future. So big disclaimer on the next two slides, uh, but just sort of, you know, two potential pathways out of a whole lot, I mean, probably an infinite number of pathways that involve, you know, suits and judges and, and a lot of people besides us making decisions. Uh, so that's another thing to consider is, you know, who's, who's making the decisions here, the local estate, us, or the courts. Um, so best case approach, and I'm probably getting, yeah, all right, as I thought, I'm sorry. Uh, so real quickly, you know, this is the, this is the perfect situation. Uh, the state gets us a serious SIP uh, by the end of this year or early next year, and we can act on it, uh, and it's a great SIP, and it can be approved, and it meets all the Clean Air Act requirements, and, uh, and we approve it. And, uh, and, we, uh, and it has measures in there, and it sets a, uh, an attainment date of probably 2024 is my guess, um, and that all those control measures uh, are effective, that uh, the local government is implementing a curtailment program, and we reach attainment. And then is the, uh, my sort of uh, keep me awake at, at night nightmare scenario where, uh, where we either don't receive a SIP uh, and or the, uh, the stakeholder group uh, does not provide an adequate uh, level of control measures and, uh, and or it doesn't demonstrate attainment. Uh, this is where, where you, know, we, you know, we really don't have a choice here. This is where things happen sort of automatically. Uh, we, uh, we get forced into a corner uh, where we have to, and, and even if we don't do it proactively ourselves, we'll get sued by somebody to do it. And, and we will have to start a sanctions clock 
uh, and 18, that, and that just, you know, it's sort of, all right, we'll give you 18 more months, and at the end of that 18 months, the first set of sanctions kick in, uh, and that's two for one offsets, which is, which is not easy for, for folks to understand, but uh, briefly, if, if there was a new economic development that wanted to come into the community, uh, into the non-attainment area, and it was going to admit, let's just say, 25 tons of, uh, of PM, uh, they need to offset that. So there's, there's no net increase. In order to come in with a new source, you need to offset those emissions. So the two for one sanction is basically saying, well, instead of needing to offset 25 tons with 25 tons, you need to offset 25 tons with 50 tons. So that's, that's the two for one. Uh, and, then, and then if we still don't correct that problem, if the locals in the states still don't correct that problem by the end of the 18-month clock, uh, then it stretches to 24 months, and at 24 months is when uh, highway, federal highway uh, stops uh, giving uh, federal highway dollars uh, to, uh, to the area. And, uh, and I think I've heard people throw out a number of about $37 million a year uh, of highway dollars that you lose. And uh, personally speaking, the worst part about that is that's when we got to come out with a federal implementation plan and take control over bringing the area into attainment. Um, and I know I'm way over, Jim, sorry. Uh, and this is really just a repeat of what I already said. Uh, the plan is, is due. Um, uh, the Clean Air Act requires the best control measures. Uh, the extension request requires the most stringent measures, uh, and we need it very, very soon. Uh, and just last closing thoughts. You know, we're here, we're, we're committed to helping you guys get there. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, progress is happening, okay? We're happy to see that, but there's still a long way to go. We're still over two times higher than where we need to be. And, uh, and the local and state decisions made in the next few months are going to affect uh, at least the next 10 years of trying to solve the problem. All right, Jim. OK, thanks, Dan. Much appreciated. So we are behind schedule, but I think this is a, a pretty important um, converse, a discussion briefing from Dan. I think we'll allow time for two questions. So who has a question? Jimmy? Oh, man, I was hoping I would drag it out long enough that I didn't have to answer any so questions. We'll go to Jimmy in here. I'll go to Jimmy first. <laughs> yep, thanks, Dan. Um, so on, on the timeline, I just want to point out that uh, I believe that the state and the borough was notified of the likelihood of non-attainment in 2006. Uh, I think when we went from 65 as a standard to 35, I believe that um, EPA notified the state and the borough that, um, hey, it looks like you're going to be out of non-attainment. Um, so, the, yeah, we officially started in 2009, but we actually yeah. had even more time. Um, which leads to the other point I want to make is that <clears throat> when we talk about state control versus local uh, ownership or management, you know, we were under state management from that time until 2014 in the borough. And when you look at those numbers for improvement, the improvement starts in 2015, if I understand the numbers, which would suggest that um, local management is actually starting to make progress. Even when you roll out um, Temperature differences, um, I, I know Nick, Nick has a graph that shows um, the air is actually being cleaned um, when you roll out uh, differences in temperature over time, but the air is starting to get cleaner since local control. So I just want to point out that um, I think that the states had uh, an opportunity to make improvements, and, and when I say the state, it was actually governors and commissioners, not, not like the employees, but we've had a long time uh, to, to get this right, and we didn't do it until the borough took, took ownership, the, the voters did. Just an observation. Yeah, like I said, local controls work best. And, and to address your, your first comment, I think it's an important one, uh, because you're right, 
dating way back to when we first uh, changed the standard. I mean, you know, federal control versus local control. This is sort of pushback area number one. You know, we came in here and, and we're starting off with the whole borough is the non-attainment area. Okay, so that was, that was where we were coming from a federal perspective. Uh, and, and thanks to your, your local elected officials like Carl and, and, your, and your state people, there was a lot of give and take and pushback on that that shrunk it down to, uh, to the size it is now. Uh, so, so thanks, Jimmy, for bringing that up. Uh, and uh, and um, yeah. UAF's doing, uh, has done studies on Arctic haze, and I believe there's a group up there right now doing research on the air quality in the interior, but when you take into account that we could also have smoke drift up from Delta Junction or Nenana through the Tananaw River Basin, you've got silt that gets blown in, and let's just say in 2019, we still do not meet the, the attainment levels required by the EPA, and the EPA comes in and takes over, and the EPA fails to also meet the attainment. What then? Well, uh, you bring up a good point about where is the pollution coming from. Uh, what, we have, what we've learned from, and, and I don't know if you were here yesterday and so, uh, okay. So, so yesterday, Barbara Trost from DEC came in here and, uh, and gave a very good presentation about all these, uh, all the monitoring they've done throughout the community. And it's, it's pretty clear, during these events that we have these exceedances, uh, the air is not moving. So we have neighborhoods where we're exceeding the standard, and we know it's wood smoke. And, uh, and, and, and you can go right over to, you know, the, the air is that stagnant, that it just, the pollution really isn't moving uh, much at all, even within the community. So, so the, the source, of the non-attainment violations is very local and it's mostly wood smoke. And we can solve the air quality problem by addressing that. That's, that's what we got. You can see even during an inversion, the power plant downtown, the stack will the exhaust will go up to a certain level and still travel, mm -hmm. even though we have stagnant air. Right. And when I used to have an office on the second floor, I could watch during the day, you see Chena Ridge real clear, but by the middle of the afternoon, it started to haze up. And you can't blame wood smoke on that one because people are at work. They're not home stoking their fires, but you do have a lot of road traffic going on. Yeah. So there's so many things in there that even road traffic is going to create Absolutely. air turbulence. So to stay, say that the air is a zero change, you're not going to have that because you are having traffic causing air to distribute throughout the community. Yeah, it, I mean, it stirs it up locally for sure, but in the air shed as a whole, uh, we, we just don't see that. But you're right, there, there are these diurnal patterns. Where, where we see the air is so stagnant, it just, it just not moving, and that's when we see these violations. And then we see these clearing events. So the air does start moving, uh, and guess what? When it moves, uh, the, 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 uh, we come below the standard. Um, so when, it's, when the air is moving, it's not when the problem is. The, when the air is not moving, is, is when we have the buildup of the concentration above the standard. And we have, I mean, Nick Shop has a lot of data showing these sort of diurnal fluctuations and, and, uh, and, and quite frankly, it makes it kind of hard to sort of dial in and, and call these uh, curtailment programs because, you know, it's all right, we got to call it and then next thing you know, we get an unexpected clear out event and uh, and then the air clears out, and then you know these guys catch slack for what are you doing calling a curtailment? The air's clean. Well, it wasn't a minute ago, and so we we do need to again locally. The best solution is for these guys to figure out how to improve uh, when these things are called and how that's implemented. 
uh, that's going to be the best way. And quite frankly, if, if we get more people uh, not burning wet wood, uh, taking advantage of the change out programs and heating the house cleaner, we're probably not going to, we're probably not going to have to call that many curtailments. So as, as we bring, you know, the, the, the total emissions down through just better burning, uh, then, then there'll be less times uh, when the curtailment's probably going to be called, thanks in part to that, you know, those periodic flushing events. But you guys, I mean, the community just needs to step up and, and make it happen. We can't do that from EPA. It needs to happen here. Okay, okay. Lenine's getting ready to drag me off here. Yeah, I've got the hook out. Okay, so next up, before we go to lunch, um, we're going to uh, have a quick stakeholders uh, update uh, from Brian Rogers and uh, John Davies, and uh, I'll just go ahead and turn it over to you guys and get started. If you want to switch slides, it's not right. sophisticated. Well, thanks, and uh, I was at an event in Anchorage on Thursday night, and people asked, what am I doing these days? And I said, well, I'm working with a group of stakeholders in Fairbanks on how we're gonna clean up our air. And the response from just about everybody was, good luck with that. But what they don't understand is Fairbanks people are problem solvers. And what we're seeing in the stakeholder group is really attacking this problem. 35 stakeholders, wood burners and suppliers, oil, people who burn oil, coal stove users, um, suppliers of natural gas, the heat and power plant operators, public health, clean air advocates, university, military, community, labor, um, environmental, all working together trying to say how are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to avoid the EPA sanctions that Dan just, just talked about? We've had support from, from EPA, from the state, a lot from the borough, um, and, and from consultants. We've had four meetings so far um, introducing the issues. We've had presentations on, uh, on different aspects of the challenge we face. Um, we've surveyed the group, much as uh, most of you are here first thing this morning. Um, going through using the clickers so that we could quickly get results. Um, we've solic solicited questions. What do we need more information about? And we've tried to make sure we answer all of those. The bulk of the work has been done by eight working groups. Um, the working groups have met during our monthly meetings or between the monthly meetings or both. Um, uh, a working group on wood devices, one on uh, smoke curtailment measures, uh, one on the point sources, the, the operators of the, the heat and power plants, uh, one group looking at oil, coal, and mobile sources, group thinking about how do we do public education on the issues, on what should we do about energy efficiency to, to make a difference in terms of the amount of heat we, we need, um, funding, how are we going to fund these problems, and what differences do we want to make on the regulatory and compliance side. So our June meeting, we sort of introduced the issues, July discussion and, and initial recommendations. Between July and August, the work groups, we, we came up with what are the top uh, 14 issues that have come out of the work groups in terms of what people think are, might have the, the biggest promise. Um, the meeting last week, we did straw polling on a variety of issues. John will be covering the results on that in just a moment. But uh, I think it, it was Jesse who talked about uh, we, people thought we'd be kicking and screaming. Well, there hasn't been any kicking and screaming. There's been real respect for each other through the process, even though we know people have strong feelings uh, about the issue um, and, and substantial disagreements on some of them, but they've been willing to work together. And it's been hard work. Um, uh, four all-day meetings in the summer in Fairbanks, and then uh, meetings on top of that in between the meetings, and then 14 of the members have been here, were here yesterday and, 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 uh, and 10 today. People are really putting in hard work and a lot of time to understand the issue and to try to understand each other's viewpoints so that we can try to reach um, a, a consensus. 
And, and so they're looking for solutions to tough issues. Um, and, and the challenge really is, I think everybody has recognized, this isn't just a technical issue. It was just a technical issue. You could wave your, wave your wand and say, we're going to do this, this, and this. But it's also an economic issue. We had a great presentation on that this morning. It's a lifestyle issue. It's a social issue and a political issue. And so putting all of those together and figuring out how we're going to optimize for the community. I, I've worked with a with a, a half dozen stakeholder processes like this. And this one is one of the most exciting to me because of the, the creativity that's coming and some of the ideas that are coming out of it. So I'm gonna to turn to John Davies now to, uh, to sort of walk, give us that progress report. We've got two more meetings before we're, we're finished. We'll be do actually doing some modeling of the results to see if we can actually reach, uh, reach attainment within a five-year period. So John, I'll turn to you and, and uh, um, and I can fill in behind you if there are any questions. Well, great. Thank, thank you, Brian. And uh, thank you all for being here. And, and I think Brian um, characterized it really well. It, it is a big challenge. If this were easy, we would have solved it a long time ago. It's not easy. It's a problem that we've been working on in a variety of different ways for quite a long time. And, and it's... Uh, as we've been working on it, we become more uh, aware of how difficult the problem really is and how, how tough it is to weigh all those uh, competing interests and competing concerns. And so I, I just, I want to also echo the thanks to the stakeholder group for the amount of time and the amount of serious effort that's going in the, into the conversations. And it, it really is remarkable, I think, how... Um, respectful everyone is and how clear everybody is in their their uh, commitment to trying to solve the problem it's a it's a it gives me a lot of hope that we can we can when we've put aside all the the campaign signs and stuff and we sit down in a room and start trying to solve the problem that we can that we will come to a solution i i'm optimistic about that but i'm this progress report is going to be sort of tempering that optimism and to give you a sense that we, we're not there yet. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, we're making progress, but there's still a lot to go. So that's my overview. Um, and then one of the first things I have to tell you is that this very first bullet on here is, is erroneous. <laughs> because it, it, uh, it came from a, a, a vote that was taken, and then, and then we decided change the vote, and so that actually is 100% was the result of one person voting, so, so <laughs> ignore the first line there. So uh, there's two slides here that talk about, that are focusing on heating devices, so that, and that uh, means solid fuel burning devices, it also means uh, oil boilers and things like that. So, so um, one of the implementation measures that we have to consider, and actually Jesse referred to this earlier in his talk, is uh, considering a registration program, and the question is how do we, how do we implement that? And so one, one of the questions, this 97 percent, uh, was to implement a registration program by adding a home heating portion to the property tax bill with a credit for completing. So that would be the, the, the uh, carrot to get people to actually complete the registration. So in, in each of these slides, the, the percentage that you see at the outset, like in this case, the 97%, um, that pertains to the number of people in the stakeholder meeting that uh, clicked the little clicker like we did earlier today and approved that idea. So 97% so of the stakeholders at that meeting last uh, Thursday or last Friday uh, agreed that we, need, we needed to implement some kind of registration program and that maybe one of the best ways to do that was with the, uh, adding a home heating portion to the property tax bill and then putting a credit when you, when you actually did the registration. 93% uh, said that we should require registration of all heating devices. So this means not, not just focusing on wood stoves but, but considering the wide range of heating devices that we have. And, the, and the, the advantage for the registration is just is fundamentally that we get more information about 
what the dimensions of the problem are, so we know how many different types of devices there are out there. So when we start to try to calculate what the efficacy of a particular measure is, we can actually have some confidence that the calculations we're doing make sense. So it's a, it's a kind of a data-driven uh, no-brainer that we need that information. It's a, a sensitive topic. I'm, I was blown away when I saw 97% of people say, in that stakeholder group saying, uh, that we need to do that. And that's, I think, a measure of, and there's a question real quick back there, what? Yeah, just how many people were actually in that stakeholder group, just for perspective on, like five? Or oh, no, much more. 15? How many people, I mean, you know, that, that matters. Do we know? The, the stakeholder group has 35 members, and I think there were 31 uh, present at, at most of the votes. Yeah, thank you for the question. So uh, then the next, the next, uh, uh, the ninety percent here is a, was an idea that we should request Congress uh, for a very large fund, uh, about forty million dollars, to try to implement a wood stove change out program that would really get us to changing out all the wood stoves that need to be changed out. So that approximately, just in rough numbers, about seven thousand devices that that needed to be changed out. We changed out about 3,000 of those 7,000, so we have 4,000 devices to go. So we've made, again, that's a sort of another indication of we've made some progress, but we've got a ways to go. It would, to, to complete that entire 4,000, we estimate we would need about $40 million. So the idea is to, is to, to say, look, if we're really gonna get there, we're gonna need some serious support. And if we wanna try to do it in a short period of time, there's no way that we can generate that kind of money locally. We're going to need some help from the state and federal government. Just a note on that one um, before he goes to the next one. There was also included in that, um, and I think an important piece of it is that um, a year later, um, after the funding is achieved, so that there's time to implement it, outdoor hydronic heaters would, be, uh, would not be permitted in the borough. Two years after that funding was achieved, um, you, uh, it mandates certified devices in the North Pole zone of the non-attainment area, and, th and in the third year, uh, the Fairbanks zone of the non-attainment area. And the reason, rationale for separating the two is we physically couldn't get all of them done in the second year, and the, the uh, North Pole has a more severe problem. So the priority for funding houses in the second, first and second year uh, would be in the North Pole zone of the non-attainment area. Okay, so the heating device group um, also considered uh, whether, whether we should implement a renewal and inspection requirement uh, that was tied into the registration of all the heating devices and a, about 87% uh, agreed with that requirement, so that um, it speaks to the issue of making sure that devices are uh, installed properly, are, are being operated properly, uh, that, that um, the right kind of wood is being burnt, and things like that. And you saw the demonstration about how important having the dry wood is. 83% said that we should change the wood change the wood stove change out program to offer higher incentives for re replacing solid food burning, so FBA is solid fuel burning appliances in multifamily st structures. So this, is, uh, this would be focusing on uh, rentals that have uh, multifamily uh, apartments in them or multiple apartments. So that's been an area where it's been hard to um, focus the responsibility. 83% uh, supported requiring notice and proof of destruction or surrender of the removed devices. And, and I should also note that in, in each of these, like th in this one, it says 57% ASP. There was a secondary vote in many of these about how quickly these, imp these measures should be implemented. And so in this case, 57% had, had supported a, essentially an immediate or one year uh, implementation of, of this requirement. And you'll see that down through the, the next one, for example, says 34% said right away, and 31% said wait till two, you know, 
extend out to 2019. So the next one uh, talks about requiring the removal of coal heaters from homes and small commercial sites. So that would, the, the vote was on should we prohibit the use and require the removal of coal heaters from homes. 79% uh, supported that one. 73% said we should create incentives for fuel oil boiler upgrades. So this is an area where you know the uh, we've we've talked about wood stove change out programs and changing out you know wood stove to wood stove with more efficient wood stoves. But there's also an opportunity to get a significant improvement if we change out oil boilers as well. Uh, I personally can tell you I changed out a perfectly good wheel McLean to a System 2000 a few years ago. I cut my fuel oil bill by a third when I did that. Even though the hang tag on both those devices is 87% efficiency, so there's there's some pretty big opportunities in in the area of focusing on oil heaters as well. And as we've discovered in this stakeholder process, the discussion we're going through, uh, one of the things that we haven't talked about in the past too enough is the issue of the sulfur. And so this is an area that we're that with now that we have to start talking about power plants, and we're starting to talk about diesel and, and uh, oil boilers, then, then the sulfur component becomes much more important. And, and so there are some opportunities where we could incentivize the improvement of, uh, of the, the efficiency of the boilers, and the more efficient it is, the less uh, emissions there will be. So that, that's another one. Um, I also, uh, we included here a couple of them where the vote was below 50%, uh, so this last one, for example, uh, was, was to uh, reduce the emissions that were allowed from a Fairbanks North Star Borough certified uh, solid fuel heating device or wood stove. And the, the idea here was we, maybe we sh it's probably likely that in the future the uh, standard for wood, wood stoves is going to get tougher right now. And right now we've, as a borough, we've set that standard at 2.5 grams per hour. And there was some thought about, well, maybe we should just take bite the bullet and right now start moving people toward 1.5 grams per hour. And that was not recommended. Uh, so th these are, there, and there was a lot of debate and discussions about these type of things. And so there, there are, is, this is an example of, that sounds like this might be a kind of a no-brainer, but, but actually there were some pretty good reasons for not, not doing that. And so uh, only 40% of the stakeholder group agreed that that would be a good move to make at this time. So there's a number of these non-recommended ones that, that are in these slides as well. So now we're going to move over to the no ash, the no other adequate source of heat, and and some issues around the stage one waiver. So 81% said that we should add an inspection for, the, for no ash. And that's, um, so that would be that, that if a person is, is, uh, is submitted to the form and has claimed that they, they have no other adequate source of heat, that then there would be an inspection required to go verify that. Then at lower levels here, 66% said that we should add a renewal requirement for the stage one waiver. And 66% also said that we should add an inspection requirement for the stage, stage one waiver. So again, this is getting at the question of, you know, are we, is, is the, uh, the home that's claiming the no ash actually, uh, actually really requiring it and, and are they actually uh, operating their, the, whatever device they have in, in the best way possible. There was uh, some discussion about the possibility of, we've, one, of the, one of the concerns, of course, that, we, that we've heard a lot and which I'm very sensitive to is that this, that people can't afford uh, to, to uh, switch. And uh, so we've tried to, we tried to bring, uh, offer a number of different ideas and had discussions about a number of different ways to make uh, the switching to an alternative source of fuel uh, more economically palatable during a curtailment period. And so one of those ideas was to consider uh, implementing uh, in a home where, there, where for, say for example, there was only a wood stove in that home, 
adding an electric baseboard heat as, a, as an alternative source and then working with GVA to supplement their uh, and, and to fund a, an emergency tariff. And what that would mean is that the cost of electricity for those people during that cur curtailment period would be reduced. Uh, so again, the idea was to make it more economically possible for those individuals who are seriously challenged with the ability to, to heat in some alternative way to, to, uh, to implement that. And uh, there was some support for that idea, but, it, but there's, there are a lot of concerns about the cost of installing uh, baseboard heat in a safe way. Probably in a lot of homes, they don't have a, they probably only have a 100 amp service. They need a 200 amp service to heat. There's, so there's a whole series of issues that, are, that complicate that idea. But again, it's, it's an idea that is illustrative of the type of discussion that's going on to try to figure out how we can come together and recognize the difficulties that different people have and then try to work through those and come up with solutions. Uh, another idea was to, especially for the NOAH, to qualify that, to provide proof that, you, that the home was a five-star rated. So this is getting at the idea of energy efficiency and should, should we try to upgrade the energy efficiency of homes that, uh, that, that are requesting the NOAH. Here, this was not recommended. Uh, I think it's in part because of the, the way that the, the question was, was offered. But it's still, I think we, we're still having some discussions about the possibility of uh, doing you know, offering an energy efficiency update and, and essentially using the, uh, the weatherization model where it would be a kind of a turnkey deal. If you agree to do the update, that, that we would pr provide the update, the upgrade, and the funding. So uh, the idea, I think that it's possible uh, for certain targeted homes to achieve a 50% energy efficiency improvement. So that, that also translates to, no matter what fuel you're burning, a 50% reduction in PM 2.5. So if we targeted that specifically at wood-burning homes, we could get a significant reduction in PM 2.5 with that type of energy efficiency improvement. So we're still, that's still under discussion, and the borough is uh, considering an application to uh, the targeted airshed grant from, from EPA to fund a, a pilot version of that program. How am I doing for time here? Or is five minutes, okay, good. All right, so then uh, there's another, another group that looked at new construction and property sales. Um, again, ideas about that, and these are, a lot of these measures are driven by, you know, things that have been done elsewhere. So under the terms of the, uh, the Clean Air Act, now that we're serious, we have to consider this uh, a range of measures, and the, and the ones that are here aren't the whole range either. So anyway, so one is uh, providing a permit for the installation of solid fuel burning devices in new construction. And so 96% said that we should consider doing that, and 69% said that that should be implemented right away. 81% supported the, uh, a proposal that wood devices would be permitted only as a secondary source in new construction, so that if you're building a new house, you have, have to have a primary source of heat that's not wood, and that, the, and that you could have a wood device if it was uh, designed as the secondary source. There was, a, there was discussion of banning hydronic heaters in new construction or when homes co go for, uh, up for sale. 57% uh, uh, supported that. There was discussion of um, requiring that new wood stoves be catalytic only. And, and only 48% supported that. So there's, there are some issues around the uh, catalytic stoves, around the maintenance, and, and uh, some issues there. There are some other possible ways to achieve that kind of uh, emissions reduction, and so, so requiring that one, uh, while it might be a good idea, didn't, the requirement for it didn't seem to be, it certainly wasn't supported by the group. There was a lot of discussion about uh, uh, kilns, and, and the, as, as we saw, the, 
the, the need for dry wood. And so there are a number of different uh, ideas out there. Um, and 100% of the group supported a public-private partnership to develop a regional kiln and distribution system so that dry wood could be available. And it would be uh, prioritized for sales in the non-attainment area. Uh, there's been discussion, for example, of the possibility of using excess heat from the Aurora plant and from the university plants in the summertime uh, to, to dry wood. There's also a fair amount of support for uh, dry wood for wet wood exchange program. So bring in your wet wood that you, got, that you cut, leave that there, get a variety of different approaches, but, but either uh, have that wood dried right away or uh, just exchange it for an equal amount of dry wood. There is a, a lot of discussion about whether we, we should require and, and only allow the sale of dry wood during the late summer to winter. The idea then, of course, is that if people are selling wet wood in the fall, there's not, there's not enough time to dry it unless you have an active kiln of some kind. And so we're gonna, getting a lot of people burning that. But that was not recommended and, and part of the reason for that is that a lot of people pointed out that, that there, for people who have a woodshed that, um, that has two seasons or more of wood in it, then, the, then buying wet wood in the fall is a perfectly rational thing to do if you're gonna dry it for a whole nother year. So, so we didn't wanna um, get in the way of that particular economic solution. That was also an issue for the cordwood suppliers who are primarily harvesting um, in the winter, January, February, March, they would not be able to sell the wood that they're harvesting and, and would put them out of business. Okay, so I got two more slides I'll, I'll walk through quickly here. So uh, on fuel oil, we also, this was all foreshadowed that there's been discussion, uh, Jesse talked about this, about prohibiting the sale of number two and in effect requiring the use of number one fuel oil and, and doing that uh, as the primary uh, response and having the, a switch to ultra-low sulfur diesel as a contingency measure. So these contingency measures are things that would get triggered if we, if, uh, if we don't meet attainment under certain circumstances. Um, another thought along those same lines was adding a surcharge to the price of number two heating oil. So if you continue to use number two, you'd pay a surcharge on that and that money would go into a, a fund for um, other um, measures, to support other measures. And those two are really designed to, to go together, and, and the second one really for, it, it will take a little bit of time for local production of number one to ramp up, and so it was to try to e even the price a little bit to encourage people moving to number one. And, and basically that cuts the sulfur dioxide emissions by about two thirds. So and then, and then uh, the last two here, there was, uh, there was a serious amount of discussion about the, the use of used oil, and uh, this, this is problematic because there's um, uh, generally a lot of heavy metals in, in, the, in the used oil, and uh, so people have, some people have advocated the uh, prohibition of that, but for a variety of reasons, neither one of these proposals to to prohibit or limit the, the use of the used oil um, was approved. And part of that has to do with just the practicality of, well, what, what are you gonna do with it otherwise? You know, are we, are we gonna just bury it in the landfill or what? So we don't have, this is an ongoing discussion. So these, these areas of non-recommended non doesn't necessarily mean that the conversation is over. It just means that we certainly didn't come to an agreement at this point in time. So the last slide here is a potpourri of, of issues that relate to the point sources, the power plants, and to uh, some ideas about enforcement and funding. Uh, so one of, the, one of the ideas around the point source, one of the concerns around the point sources is that, that to make some of the proposals that make the changes to scrubbers and injection systems that have been discussed that we have to consider, uh, everybody recognizes that those are going to be extremely expensive. There's a lot of money to, to do those. And so if there's some way to uh, modify that and, and then create an offset banking fund that the state of Alaska would, would administer, that would, that would allow the point sources to place offset dollars into that fund to help fund other PM 2.5 control measures. So, 
for example, there could be a tax on emissions that, that the point sources would pay in lieu of um, doing expensive retrofits. And then that, that money would go into a fund that would then be used to, do, to implement other PM 2.5 control measures that might be argued to be much more efficacious. Um, There's, uh, there was some discussion about um, we, it would be good for the, the borough and the power plants to support a fund, uh, support and fund a uh, speciation study to determine the level of point source contribution to the SO2 problem. So there's one of the issues around SO2 is we don't, we know that there's, from the speciation studies, that there's a fairly large amount of SO2 that's being emitted. We don't fully understand the dimensions of where that's all coming from, and so to have a better idea about what the actual contribution from the point sources is to that problem would be helpful. Uh, so then, then there's some other ideas on compliance and enforcement. Clearly, one of the one of the lessons from the compliance uh, curtailment programs in other communities is that when you have a, a compliance event or a burn ban in place, an episodic burn ban, um, it's important to have a significant amount of enforcement in the field. And, and the borough right now does not have an adequate amount of an, number of enforcement officers. And so we, we, we've been discussing ways to ramp that up and other communities had a variety of other uh, possibilities. One way that was discussed here was to have the point sources sponsor uh, uh, curtailment enforcement teams, and this is sort of a uh, offshoot of the kind of discussion about this uh, offset fund idea. Uh, and finally, um, another creative idea was was to perhaps request co the congressional delegation to amend the Superfund law, which has to do with uh, water pollution issues, groundwater pollution. Uh, to allow federal funding for airshed cleanup efforts. So this would be an attempt to get uh, uh, another source of funding uh, to help us uh, with, the, with the airshed cleanup. Um, I, guess I have to editorial a little bit. So I, I think that the, the likelihood that Congress is going to open up that particular can of worms is pretty, probably pretty low. But, but anyway, uh, I put one of the reasons I wanted to just put that, that illustrates to you the, the breadth of the conversation that's going on. People are looking at a whole range of ideas, some of which are going to be practical and some of which aren't, but we have to work through them. And I think that, so the, prog the, the status report is that we're making progress, we're having substantive conversations. Really a lot of work, as, as Brian indicated, there's been a lot of work in these breakout groups where the people that are targeting a particular uh, aspects of the problem are getting together and really focus on that for several hours at a time to try to figure out how, you know, throw ideas out there on the table, work through them, discuss them, figure out how we, we might go forward. So we're, we're getting to the point now where we're going to have a series of, of, you know, sort of tentatively proposed measures. And then, then the next requirement is going to be, okay, so if we did this, how close to uh, attainment would we get? And so then we're going to have to go and actually do some some serious calculations about the efficacy of each one of these measures and to, to, to determine whether we, this, the SIP based on those would achieve attainment or not. So that's kind of the, I think, where we are in the conversation right now. I think a, a couple of areas that we'll see some more work. Uh, there's more work to do on the point sources and how the offset would work and how much money that would generate and whether that will, will work. There's more work to be done on uh, what might be some energy efficiency uh, area and then in the in the compliance and enforcement areas. I think all of those need a little more work, um, maybe a little more on, on education as well. How do we get everybody to realize um, what that wood smoke demonstration uh, outside just, just showed us? But the, uh, we've got two more meetings to go and hopefully by November we'll have enough that the state can write a state implementation plan that, uh, that passes muster. So we have a question over here. So real quick, so just so folks know, we're going to probably have some more conversation about this throughout the day, after, especially after lunch with some insta-polling and some breakout sessions. Um, 
John and Brian are your barriers to lunch right now. I just want to make that clear. So, <laughs> right. um, so. so let's do like maybe one question, two tops, keep it to maybe process maybe, and we'll talk details later in the day. So Tim has his hand up. He's the barrier to lunch. Yeah, I'll take. I'll I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, hey, I, yesterday I was uh, I and the other panel members at the end of the day were asked a lot about the what if question, and I just want one one at the very beginning of your presentation, you highlighted for me one of the really great uh, examples of why local control makes more sense, the idea of a tax credit for registration. Uh, registration is an absolutely critical element of any curtailment program. Uh, but you can, you can do it the easy way, you can do it the hard way. And the tax credit idea is a great example of doing it the easier way. So, um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And then um, just to make sure everyone knows, the reason uh, EPA is encouraging conversation about an offset program is that, um, you know, it's not that we don't think the stationary sources shouldn't do their fair share, but when you look at the cost of some of the retrofits that the Clean Air Act um, on paper requires, and you compare that to the benefit we think would show up uh, in the air quality data, it doesn't look like a great return on investment, and the idea is the offset fund might be better ways to get a good return on investment that gets the community closer to attainment. So just a quick couple quick comments and I'm handing it over. <laughs> Marianne, did, was it you that had a comment? Was one more comment over here in this area? Okay, go ahead, Marianne, one comment. I just wondered if uh, there'd been a video made of the demonstration that the local news could put on the air. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, John. Much appreciated. I guess we'll see more of you this afternoon. So we're going to break for lunch, but as you're kind of getting ready to leave, don't forget we still have the wood-burning demo going on outside, and it's quite impressive how this turned out this time. Uh, we've got cold cuts and soup sandwiched down in the uh, uh, lunch area to, the, uh, to my right out the door there, and we'll see you back here at 1.15.